Welcome to Hope Sabbath School, an in-depth, interactive study of the Word of God. We're in a series on the Psalms, ancient scripture songs inspired by the Holy Spirit, some more than 3,000 years old, some more recent, but all with powerful messages for our lives today. Our topic today, wisdom for righteous living, a very practical topic. And I'm excited today because one of our team members, Stephanie, is going to lead the study. It's going to be a great study, I know. We want to welcome our team members. Can you give a wave to everybody out there, part of our Hope Sabbath School family? And we've also got some remote team members. Sabina, good to have you with us today. Always glad to have you on the team. Let's see who else we have. Travis, good to see you, Travis. Glad you're with us remotely today. And Trisha Lee, good to see you. Always good to have our remote team members. We're glad that you're part of our Hope Sabbath School team as well. People write and say, Derek, when one of the teachers asks a question, I raise my hand. That's good. In fact, someone just today I was reading, they said, our Bibles are always open, turning to the Bible passages. We want this to be an in-depth interactive study for each one of us wherever we are. Well, Moses writes to us from Papua New Guinea. And Moses says, Greetings, Hope Sabbath School team. Greetings. Greetings. Hope Sabbath School Bible study is so inspiring. Thank you to the wonderful team. Amen. Amen. Well, thanks for writing to us, Moses, from Papua New Guinea. Here's a note on our YouTube channel from Isabella. You know, our YouTube channel continues to grow, more and more people subscribing. Isabella writes and says, Thank you, Hope Sabbath School family. I've been listening to you for the last nine years, mm. and my life has changed immensely. Amen. And we say, Amen. Praise God, right? Thanks to all of you for sacrificing so much to share the good news about Jesus. Mm. I love your enthusiasm, your testimonies, your experiences, and the cultural diversity of the team. Mm -hmm. Take a look at each other. We don't all look the same. We look like the worldwide family of God, right? Amen. A real model of what heaven will be like, Isabella Amen. writes. Mm -hmm. I can't wait to meet you all face to face in the magnificent city of pure gold. Amen. I think she's talking about the New Jerusalem, yes, right? Amen. Thank you, Isabella, for writing to us on our YouTube channel. Well, here's a donor couple from Georgia in the United States of America, a little handwritten note, and they say, the wife writes, my husband and I have been watching Hope Sabbath School for many months now on Sabbath mornings. We always come away feeling richly fed by the Word of God. Amen. Yeah. Amen. That's why we do this, right? Yes. We're impressed by the team and the wisdom uncovered in the discussions. Our Bibles are in constant use <laughs> as we follow along. Thank you for a program that feeds us at home. Amen. Enclosed is a donation to keep to help you continue your work of blessing others and a donation of a thousand dollars. Amen. To bless God. the Amen. ministry of Hope Sabbath School. Thank you, donor couple. You know, we don't read names of donors, but we do want to say thank you. And thank you to each one of you for partnering with us, whether it's ten dollars or a thousand dollars or somewhere in between or five dollars. We can all say, I want to be part of the mission. And I always think of Jesus with that widow who gave all she had. And she wanted to be part of the mission, too. Well, one last note from Kwamboka. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to know Zendiri, what her name meant, Kwamboka. So I asked her, and she said, one who was born while crossing a river. Oh. I said, oh, <laughs> I guess that was an interesting delivery <laughs> for Mama uh, Kwam. Kwamboka writes, and she says, I love Hope Sabbath School. Should we give Kwamboka a wave, by the way? That's a beautiful name, isn't it? One born while crossing a river. I always enjoy watching every Friday evening. I enjoy the interactions that make the lesson study easy to follow 
and understand, plus the examples from life. Mm -hmm. God bless you all. Kwamboka, you'll always remember her name. And we're thankful, Kwamboka, that you are part of our Hope Sabbath School family. <clears throat> well, before we sing our theme song, I want to remind you of a very special gift we have for you during this series. Just available during this series, a collection of six trilogy scripture songs, all from the Psalms. That's what we're studying in this series, including our theme song, Psalm 105. You can get that collection as a gift just by going to our website, hopetv.org slash hope SS. If you don't know how to do that, well, maybe ask the youngster in your family and they'll show you how to go to hopetv.org slash hope SS. Click on the free gift tab and you'll find out how you can download that collection of beautiful scripture songs. If you're interested, Psalm 9, some of you know that one. I will praise you, O Lord, with my whole heart. Mm -hmm. Psalm 27, Psalm 42. 42, 105, 134, and 139. You say, dear, I can't remember that. Okay, just go to the website, download that collection, and you can share it with others as a blessing to them. Right now, we need your help. We need you to sing our theme song with us from an ancient inspired song, Psalm 105. <laughs> And that's exactly what we want to do right now, Stephanie, as we begin our study. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much that you've given us your word that teaches us wisdom. I pray that it would not just be knowledge today, but it would be life changing. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 So I have a question for you. Our study is on wisdom for righteous living. What is wisdom? Who can tell me what wisdom is? Harold? Well, um, having good judgment, a good sense, so having discernment. Having good judgment, discernment. Samuel? I've heard it said that wisdom is the application of knowledge. The application of knowledge. So we're, we're looking at wisdom being the application of knowledge, good judgment. Mm -hmm. So where do you find good knowledge and good judgment? Mm -hmm. oh. Brittany in the Word of God in the Word of God would you take us there sure second Timothy chapter 3 verse 16 what does the Bible say second Timothy chapter 3 verse 16 I'll be reading from the New King James Version second Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16 says all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So where do we find wise counsel? In the word All scripture. God. All scripture, right? In the word of God, right? In his counsel. So I'm thinking about, there's a book that's called the book of wisdom. Do you know which book that is? Proverbs. Proverbs, right. That's what comes to our mind when we think of, about uh, wisdom, that it's filled with wisdom. 
Samuel. You know, I, I was doing a search this morning, and the word wisdom appears 54 times in the book of Proverbs. Oh. 54 times. Wow. And of course, our study today is on Psalm, but it's interesting to know where that wisdom comes from, right? Mm -hmm. So let's find out who the source of, or the uh, author was of the book of Proverbs. And we'll look in Proverbs chapter one, verse one. And Trisha Lee, would you read that for us? We're looking at who the primary author was of the book of Proverbs. Reading from the New King James Version. The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel. All right, so the primary author was who? <laughs> Solomon. Trick question, uh -huh. right? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so what are you thinking, Derek? Well, I'm thinking all scripture is God breathed, which means the spirit of God is the primary agent in communicating Bible truth. But he uses men and women to, to write that down, to record it. Certainly Solomon was one of those. So I guess it would say that God used Solomon to share words of wisdom. But I like what was said earlier, it's wise living, because he wasn't always living. Mm -hmm. Wisely. Wisely. That's right, that's right. Thank you very much. Mm. Pedro, would you take us to 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20 and 21? Yes. This actually confirms what Derek said, um, spirit inspired. Second Peter chapter one, verse 20 and 21. I'll be reading from the New King James Version, uh, second Peter one, verses 20 and 21. And it says, knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of men, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. All right, spirit inspired again. The okay. Holy Spirit worked mm -hmm. through these individuals. Go ahead, Samuel. You know, I, I was reading a book this uh, past week and the author talked about how God is the author of the scriptures and the human prophets were writers. God is the author, the humans were writers. And he used this interesting analogy. Um, you know, there are some people like sports person, you know, they write their biography, but they're not necessarily qualified or skilled in writing. And so they hire these writers to whom they recount their messages and they are the ones who write them down. Who's the author? Well, it's the story, you know, it's, it belongs to that sports person, but the writers, they are just, they rest, just write what the message was given mm. to them. And so I thought, I think that's it, it's important, but it's also important to realize that Scripture is not just dictation. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a few times it says, and the Lord said, mm -hmm. fear not for I'm with you. That's right. That's dictation, right? Mm -hmm. and, and the prophet writes that. But, but God also uses the personality mm -hmm. and the mm -hmm. cultural context of the author. So yes. I think what we would say is that it's thought inspiration. Mm -hmm. uh, and if there's something the Lord wants you to write word for word, mm -hmm. he'll say, write this down. Yeah. And, and they do. And that's yes. important, too. But mm -hmm. some people might have the idea that, that we're just a pen. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think we're actually uh, led by the yeah. Holy Spirit mm -hmm. through our... Right. I was going to say penman or penwoman, you know, pen mm -hmm. person. Uh, we, we're actually writing as the Holy Spirit inspires mm -hmm. thought. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, Pedro. I see this in the beauty of relationship because God's a relational God. He wants to communicate with us in a personal level. And I see uh, Solomon here asking for something beautiful. You know, he wants to live righteously on his life. And I think the Bible shows that. Yes, it does. And let, let's turn to 1 Kings chapter 3 and look at verses 6 through 12. And Gladys, would you read that for us? 1 Kings chapter 3, verses 6 through 12, and see what Solomon asked for. 1 Kings chapter 3, verses 6 to 12. And I'm reading from the New International Version. And it says, Solomon answered, you have shown great kindness to your servant, my father David, because he was faithful to you and righteous and upright in heart. 
You have continued this great kindness to him and have given him a son to sit on his throne this very day. Now, Lord, my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father, David, but I'm only a little child and do not know how to carry out my duties. Your servant is here among the people you have chosen, a great people, too numerous to count or number. So give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. For who is able to govern this great people of yours? The Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for this. So God said to him, since you have asked for this and not for long life or wealth for yourself, nor have asked for the death of your enemies, but for discernment in administering justice, I will do that what you have asked. I will give you a wise and discerning heart so that there will never have been anyone like you, nor will there ever be. So at this point, where do we, where do we see Solomon, his approach to God's uh, question mm. in his answer, Brittany? He's very humble. Mm. He's coming That's as right. a, a mm -hmm. child, even though he wasn't physically a child, mm -hmm. but he's coming with that attitude like, Lord, I need to be taught by you. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to govern this great people that you've given me charge over. I mm -hmm. need you to show me what to do. Mm. Yeah. Yes. Puya. I see humility in yes. Solomon coming before God with a humble heart, asking for that wisdom and discernment. And the Lord gave it to him. Yeah. Let's move over to chapter four and look at verses 29 through 34. There's a piece of information in there that we'll look at later in our lesson. So Travis, would you read that for us? First Kings four, verse 29 through 34. And I'll be reading from the New King James Version. And God gave Solomon wisdom and exceedingly great understanding and largest of heart like the sand on the seashore. Thus Solomon's wisdom excelled the wisdom of all the men of the East and all the wisdom of Egypt. For he was wiser than all men, than Ethan, than Ezraite, and Haman, Kelkol, and Darda, the sons of Mahol. And his fame was in all the surrounding nations. He spoke 3,000 proverbs, and his songs were 1,005. Also he spoke of trees, from the cedar trees of Lebanon to the hyssop that springs out of the wall. He spoke also of animals, of birds, of creeping things, and of fish. And men of all nations, from all the kings of the earth, who had heard of his wisdom, came to hear the wisdom of Solomon. Mm. Thank you, Travis. So what can we learn here? <laughs> Everyone knew about his wisdom, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he was wiser, and there was a list there. We'll come back to that later in our lesson. But the point is, is that God gave him what he asked for. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, how does that apply to me? Mm -hmm. Because sure, he gave him wisdom, but <laughs> how do I have access to that? Or do I not have access, mm -hmm. Puya? Uh, this is so practical because no matter what you do, what line of work you are in, you can apply this in your own life mm -hmm. and come to God and say, God, I'm like a little child. I don't <laughs> know how to lead or how to do my work properly, so give me wisdom. Mm -hmm. And God is always looking for people who are seeking Him. So this is a very good uh, lesson for anybody. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm. That wisdom is available, mm -hmm. and I see hands. Uh, Travis, I saw your hand. So Stephanie, this reminds me of one of the great reformers, you know, when you're talking about the, the um, uh, Solomon and all his wisdom, and it talks about all the Proverbs and a thousand and five songs. And I'm just thinking of Charles Wesley. The guy wrote 6,500 hymns plus, I don't know how many sermons. And, and God is just as willing to give us wisdom. And we've seen that through the Reformation and through God has his people and he's willing to pour his wisdom out on anyone who asks, I believe. Mm. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Sandili. Uh, I was reminded of Matthew chapter six. Mm -hmm. Matthew when, chapter six. Yes. Mm -hmm. When, uh, when, Jesus says, seek ye first the kingdom of heaven, mm -hmm. and all these things shall be added unto you. Mm -hmm. uh, Solomon seeked 
discernment, the wisdom, the right thing to do. And later on, all these other things were added unto his life. So if we seek God first, he will definitely add all the other things that he knows we need. Zandili, mm-hmm. would you take us to a verse in James, James okay. chapter 1, verse 5? So, And while we're looking, uh, Stephanie, I was looking in the margin when it talked about an understanding heart. Mm-hmm. And, and in my margin, it said literally hearing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, so that, you know, I'm listening to God. It's not like I'm smart. My IQ is 185. Yes. It, it's someone who's listening to the source of all wisdom. Yes, and that comes back to what Puya and Brittany were saying about coming in humility. Right. Thank you. Sandili. Okay, and I'll be reading uh, from the ESV, James chapter 1, verse 5, and it says, If you, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. So there's our answer, right? (laughs) Um, Just as Solomon had wisdom and was given wisdom because he asked, we also can have that wisdom by submitting and and asking him for that. Mm -hmm. Now let's take a look at some of the Psalms. Mm -hmm. In the book of Psalms, we'll start out with Psalm 127 and read, verse 1 through 5. And Sabina, if you would read that for us, Psalm 127, verses 1 through 5. And let's see what kind of wisdom for our life today we can find in this psalm. Okay, so I'll be reading from the New King James Version. And Psalm 127, verses 1 to 6, uh, says the following. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain, who built it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he gives his beloved sleep. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but shall speak with their enemies in the gate. Mm. Mm. What wisdom do you find for life in this Psalm of Solomon? Mm. Gladys. I like it in the first few verses, they say, unless the Lord builds the house. Mm. So that, that, that applies to everything, everything we do in our work. You can be very smart, have many degrees, many letters after your name. And still, if the Lord is not the center of it, if the Lord is not the one giving you the wisdom, everything will be in vain. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Uh, Harold. Yeah, like the first two verses kind of uh, led me to like Matthew when Jesus spoke, like don't hoard treasures on earth but mm-hmm. hold your treasures in heaven. Because if you think about it, if we tend to like focus on our, our you know, earthly possessions and we lose it, we'll be very stressed. Mm-hmm. We'll be like, oh, why this? I spent so much time. But if we allow the Lord to take care of it, even if we lose it, we know that God is still taking care of us. And mm-hmm. he will probably, you know, make it uh, a testimony for somebody of how the Lord helped us go through that difficulty. You never know. So we'll be at peace regardless. That's right, because we know that he's in control, right? Yep. Mm-hmm. Mm. Pedro. Well, I, I can speak of the latter part of the Psalms, having children is mm. a blessing from the Lord. Actually, uh, I, have, I was talking to someone about this uh, recently, that having a child that helps you understand how God sees us, because mm. I see the fragility of my daughter. I see her needs, her wants, her stubbornness. <laughs> and I see myself and I say, thank you, God, for being a loving father to me. Oh, Amen. Right. Thank Beautiful. you for sharing that. Sabina. Stephanie, I also find that this song has wisdom in inviting us to have a balanced life uh, by inviting us even to sleep, right? He's uh, presenting here a person that potentially is uh, toiling and is working so hard without leaning on God. Uh, and maybe even is losing some hours of sleep trying to achieve things that uh, are not that important and that God actually would be able to provide according to their needs. So I think there is also wisdom here for 
uh, wholesome living, you know, to make sure that we can rest and rest in God, including taking time to sleep. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, that really resonated with me. It did. You know, I'm feeling sad though, because he knew he shouldn't take an unbelieving wife, a pagan wife. True. But he ended up with 700 mm -hmm. and 300 concubines. Mm -hmm. So there's this dislocation. Thank God later he says, I figured it out. You know, reverence God and keep his commandments. That's right. This mm -hmm. is the whole duty mm -hmm. at the end of Ecclesiastes. But, but really, uh, <laughs> You know, he didn't live the wisdom that was given to him. That's right. Mm -hmm. at, at least for portions of his life, yeah. because uh, the, the result was damage to his kingdom by mm -hmm. not following the truth that he knew. Mm -hmm. And it's unfortunate that that damage went from generation to generation. Mm -hmm. he, when he returned to God, he could not change everyone's direction. Mm -hmm. And so that's something that we have to keep in mind, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Our choices impact others' choices mm -hmm. as well. All right, let's turn to Psalm 90. And this is the Psalm of Moses. And Huya, would you read that for us? Sure. Psalm 90, and that would be verses 1 through 17. All right. Psalm 91 to 17, and I'm reading from the New King James Version. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Mm. You turn man to destruction and say, Return, O children of man. For a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it is past, and like a watch in the night. You carry them away like a flood. They are like a sleep. In the morning they are like grass which grows up. In the morning it flourishes and grows up. In the evening it is cut down and withers. For we have been consumed by your anger, and by your wrath we are terrified. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your countenance. For all our days have passed away in your wrath. We finish our years like a sigh. The days of our lives are 70 years. Mm. Mm. And if by reason of strength, they are 80 years. Yet their boast is only labor and sorrow. For it is soon cut off and we fly away. Who knows the power of your anger? For as the fear of you, so is your wrath. So teach us to number our days, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Return, O Lord, how long? And have compassion on your servants. O oh, satisfy us early with your mercy, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad according to the days in which you have afflicted us, the years in which we have seen evil. Let your work appear to your servants, and your glory to their children. And let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. Hmm. Thank you for reading that long passage. <laughs> verse 12, I like us to think about verse 12. What does it mean to number our days? Mm. Gladys. I think that that is like, pay attention to details. You know, sometimes we're so busy with things. We, we go, 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 go. And we don't take advantage of what is given today. We're thinking about tomorrow. We think about the past, regrets, pains, and we don't take advantage of what God has given us. That is right now, today. Mm -hmm. Thank mm -hmm. you. Sabina. Stephanie, I think that's one of the verses uh, in Psalms that I use more often. And that's because oftentimes when people have their birthday, I take the time if I'm writing a card to add this verse. <laughs> and it's because I believe it's an invitation for we to uh, use well our, our time, the time that was given to us by God. There is wisdom in that, to be reminded that this life that we have is just a short span in eternity. So that can help us readjust our values. You know, like what is it that you are using your time with? Uh, you know, it's just 80, 70 years. Is, is this the things that you are building up here uh, worth for eternity? Or you are building up or accumulating things just for your, um, you know, passing through those 70, 80 years? 
And if we don't take the time to count our days, we can just sleep off in, in, in the living uh, of things that are not heavenly, right? So there is wisdom there. Thank you, Sabina. Trisha Lee. The reality is that we really don't know how much time that we have here. We would like it to be 70, 80, 90, or even more but unfortunately, because of sin and sickness, um, we don't know how much time we have. And so numbering our days, like Sabina said, means that each day is important. We know we won't live forever, but tomorrow isn't promised either. And so what can I do today to uh, honor the Lord and be a blessing to those around me? How can I live each day as though it's very special and important because I really don't know how many um, days I truly have. And so when I read this verse, it reminds me um, to know that time is precious. It's a gift not to be squandered um, and that I need to use the time that I have to the, to the most um, that I can to bless others and to make sure that I am investing in my time and my relationship with God. I thank you Amen. very much. Oh. Intentional living. Yes. yes. Intentional living. Samuel. And then this passage to me talks about how we need to prioritize eternity mm -hmm. over this earthly life that we have. Because, you know, this earth and the life that we have here, you know, that's just temporary. God has an eternity. And this passage calls us to mm. prioritize that eternity and make wise decisions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is a really important topic, isn't it? Yes. Yep. Were there any other comments that I missed? <laughs> All right. Let's move on to the next question. Uh, what experience in your life, in your personal life, mm. has brought to your reality that life is short? <laughs> mm -hmm. mm. And how has that impacted mm. the trajectory of your life mm -hmm. as a result? Gladys. Yeah, I was teaching uh, before and I remember this particular day um, I was rushing around and I was giving quizzes to, to my to my students and this particular child just kept clinging to me and clinging to me and just I want to hug you Miss G I want to hug you and I was like okay but I need to move I need to move but she was always clinging to me and at the end of the day she was like I'll see you tomorrow Miss G I said I'll see you tomorrow baby and that night I got a phone call. She didn't reach home. Oh. Her sister got caught in a car accident and they both died. Mm. And in my heart, even ever since, that was just stuck in my head. She was so excited that day and I'm gonna see you tomorrow. Mm. And tomorrow never came for her. So that impacted my life in the way that I had to make sure that every day mm. I was not only right with God, mm. but I made a right with each of my children because I didn't know if that was going to be my last mm. impact in their lives. Mm. She'll be wow, looking for Gladys. you when Jesus comes. Yes. 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 I never knew you were Miss G, yeah. but Gladys, you know, that's the impact, isn't it? She yes. loved you. And uh, by God's grace, you'll be looking for her when Jesus returns. Yes. Mm. Yes. Thank you for sharing. Puya. As a pastor, I have done a number of uh, funeral services, mm -hmm. and whenever I, you know, speak at a funeral service and lead lead the families through the whole experience, it always reminds me of the shortness of life. Yeah. Sometimes it's an older person. Sometimes, unfortunately, you know, a younger person with so much potential that the family and all of us at the church would consider. Ha at that young man having a bright future mm. unexpectedly had to you know say goodbye for this time and so for me personally mm. going to funeral services attending funeral services and even visiting you know uh, people in the graves uh, in the in the cemetery reminds me of how short life on this earth is mm -hmm. Mm. Samuel you know, when I was a teenager, without going into all the details, when I was a teenager, I had a couple of accidents that could have ended my life, mm -hmm. mm. very serious ones. But if not for God, I wouldn't be here. And so those, as I reflect back on those in instances where God saved me, it reminds me that God has a plan and a purpose mm -hmm. you know, for me on this earth. And, and so that is what it shows to me. As I look mm, back. Thank you. Sanjali. 
Mm, I wanted to say for me personally, it has helped me to avoid procrastinating mm. because sometimes uh, I feel like I have all the time that I need, mm. but tomorrow is not guaranteed as the other speakers say. So it really uh, helps to make decisions when there is need to. Mm. Okay. Yes. Amen. Amen. That is true. Do, did you want to... Share well, no, I resonated certainly but, with Samuel, but I see some of our remotes yes. waving. <laughs> okay. So, uh, but, but yeah, we've, we've had times when we go, I, I should not have survived. Mm -hmm. And God was merciful mm -hmm. to us. Amen. Sabina. Uh, I've shared this experience before, but maybe there is someone who have not heard it yet. And that's, I think, one of the most life-changing experiences that I've gone in my life, which was uh, losing my, my dad when I was a teenager. And I think that to add to what was said already regarding, you know, losing people or regarding watching death uh, before your eyes. In my case, I think that what was the most life changing is because my dad was still a young person. He had energy, he had strength and watching the frailty that we have physically speaking also um, added to that experience, not only the, the suddenness the brevity, but also the, the physical frailty that one day you may be feeling very well and another day, not so much. And that whole experience led me to seek God. You know, I was not, uh, I was a Catholic at that time, but I didn't really had an experience with Jesus until then. So that whole experience led me to question the purpose of life and also to decide if there was a God out there that I wanted to live according to his wisdom, to his principles, to his purpose, because it seemed to me that life otherwise had no, no meaning to, to live by. So for me, that was life changing. It was the moment that I turned my heart to God and eventually Jesus came through. So that really was um, tremendous to me. Thank you, Sabina. Mm. Travis? So this psalm reminds me, uh, and many of you have heard my testimony about being in the deer stand and having a revelation of God's love when I was reading The Desire of Ages. But as I'm reading this psalm, there's this conversation about God's wrath, which we know is not poured out on people, but sin. And I think it's an invitation, as a, a kind of an exciting invitation for us to, to set sin aside, not worry about uh, so we don't have to worry about God's wrath on sin and enjoy the mercies of the Lord. That's how it ends, that, that we would enjoy um, an invitation to enjoy the mercies of God. And that's what happens when we find Jesus is we're not living a life of fear anymore. And so here we have this limited number of days. I think God wants us to enjoy all our days on earth mm. in the context of his love and mercy towards us. Instead of living all those days of our life in fear, of the wrath uh, that God will be poured out on, on sin eventually. Thank you, Travis. And if you'll just stay with us for a few more um, minutes and, and read for us Psalm 141, verses 1 through 10, we'd like to see some additional wisdom from this psalm. Actually, a psalm, psalm of David. Psalm 141? Yes. 1 through 10, and I'll be reading from the New King James Version. Lord, I cry out to you. Make haste to me. Give ear to my voice when I cry out to you. Let my prayer be set before you as incense. The lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Do not incline my heart to any evil thing. To practice wicked works with men who work iniquity and do not let me eat of their delicacies. Mm. Let the righteous strike me. It shall be a kindness and let him rebuke me and it shall be an excellent oil. Let my head not refuse it. For still my prayer is against the deeds of the wicked. Their judges are overthrown by the sides of the cliff and they hear my words for they are sweet. Our bones are scattered at the mouth of the grave mm. As, one, as when one plows and breaks up the earth. But my eyes are upon you, O God, the Lord. In you I take refuge. Do not leave my soul destitute. Keep me from the snares they have laid for me and from the traps of the workers of iniquity. Let the wicked fall into their own nets while I escape 
safely. Thank you, Travis. And I, I want to ask Trisha Lee. Trisha Lee, in verse four, what warning do we see of this progression to evil? What warning do we see there? Um, <laughs> I was really latching on to that verse and contemplating it. So I know it's the Holy Spirit why you called on me. But I was reading this and I was thinking it was written by David. And here's a man who was being pursued relentlessly by his enemies. Um, and they intended evil for him. They wanted to take his life. And how easy it would be to replicate or reflect that same evil. You know, when people are chasing you to do harm to you, you might want to seek to do harm to them as well. And we see in his own life that he always took the higher road, so to speak. He always sought to do what he believed God would want, not to harm those who sought to harm him. And when I think about the progression, it's that you can be surrounded by evil and eventually you start to reflect the same evil you're surrounded by. Mm -hmm. But in the case of David being pursued by King Saul and his men, he didn't do that. In one instance, he had the opportunity to take his enemy's life and he wouldn't touch God's anointed. Mm -hmm. And so at the end of this passage, it says that the righteous escape, but the wicked fall into their own trap. And he's mm -hmm. saying, I won't be the one to return evil to you, but I'll allow you to reap what you've already sown. And I think that's amazing wisdom and the protection of God to be surrounded by evil, but not to fall into the cycle of repeating that evil. And I think in some ways that's a progression that we see it, we reflect it. But in this case, it's not, he's saying it's not happening. Hmm. Thank you, Trisha Lee. Gladys. Yeah, I like the, the, the part that, that he just surrenders everything about himself. He's saying, no, set a guard over my mouth mm. and then do not let my heart be drawn to evil. And then it, just like humbleness, you know, let, it, let them strike me. I'm gonna, not going to respond. So he's totally surrendering to the will of God. Gladys, mm. what, imp what impresses you when you, when you see that, that let, let them smite me? It will be kindness. What does that mean to you? Well, I think that uh, when somebody hurts you and it is out of envy or spite and you are covered with God and, and, and you are leaving God's life, I think that it is a testimony to others. So I think that kindness has to do with, with, with what God has done in your life. Mm -hmm. But actually, so, Stephanie, that's not what the text is saying here. It says, let the righteous strike me. Mm -hmm. it, it's like I'm running out into the road. I'm about to be hit by a truck. Right. Mm -hmm. Who is beside me? And if necessary, he'll knock he'll me out. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. It's an act of kindness mm -hmm. when a righteous person yes. stops me. That's right. Yeah. Loves me enough to stop me. No, I, mm -hmm. I do believe what Gladys is saying that we should love our enemies and so on. But, but here in the text, yeah. actually, it says, let the let righteous just, strike just me striking, yeah. and it shall be kindness. Let him rebuke me. It shall I be an excellent oil. oil. Yes. So I think part of humility, which is mm -hmm. a word we're hearing over and over again, it may not be easy mm -hmm. for, for Brittany to come to me and say, Derek, I think, you know, I think that was a mistake. Yeah. I think the direction you're heading is dangerous, mm -hmm. but but if the love of God is in her heart, you will accept it. And I know that That's we're right. family of God together. Yeah. It's actually an act of kindness. Yes. Mm. So I just want to point yeah. out this, this is not an evil person striking it's you in this passage. Person. Someone who yeah. cares. It's somebody who, best. and someone who's righteous. Right. Mm -hmm. So someone who's connected to God, God. God's leading in that. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Harold. And actually Solomon echoes this, I think it's in Proverbs 9, can remember the verse where he says, you know, rebuke a righteous man and he will love you. Mm -hmm. mm. Of course, and it's kind of, obviously Solomon came from David, but it's just very interesting how he's remembering probably what his father taught him mm. when he was like raising him. Yes, mm. Samuel. You know, we're talking about wisdom for righteous living. And one wisdom that I find here is that, you know, David, he realizes how easy it is for him to fall into the trap mm -hmm. and how, you know, he's unable of himself to save himself from the trap. And mm -hmm. so he's asking for God to help him to escape from devil's trap. And so I think that's mm -hmm. something that we ought to do daily. 
Amen. Thank you. Well, we could have a study just on that yeah. psalm, couldn't we? <laughs> yes. Let's go to Psalm 119. And I know for many, this has been, it has provided wise counsel. So I'd like to open up the floor for your testimonies. What verse in Psalm 119 has been especially important to you and why? Oh. Hmm. What was the situation? What was the scenario about that? Lord. Well, yeah, I see a big <laughs> smile back there. There, there are just so many verses from the hmm. Psalm 119 that speaks to my heart. One of them is uh, verse 9. If I could read uh, Psalm 119, verse 9. Sure, uh, Psalm 119 and verse 9. Verse 9, and I'll be reading from the New King James Version. It says, How can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. Mm. This speaks to me because uh, as a young man, you know, as a teenager, I read this text and I took it to my heart to say, okay, how can I live my life mm. in a way that is righteous before God? The answer is right here, yeah. according to the Word. Amen. Amen. Spend time in the Word. Get to know God through His revelation in the Word. And so this is really good for me. Yeah. So it's going back to filling our minds with the Word of God, right? Amen. Amen. Gladys. Yeah, I'm, I love the whole song, <laughs> but um, I want to share with you one, 119 verses 73 and 74. Okay. Psalm 119 verses 73 and 74, New International Version says, Your hands made me and formed me. Give me understanding to learn your commands. May those who fear you rejoice when they see me for I have put my hope in your word. Mm. So it's like, it, it just grounds me to know that no matter what I go through, God already knows everything about me because he made me. Mm. But I want my life to be a testimony to others. So when they see me, they will rejoice because the word of God is holding me. Mm. So I just, I just love those two verses. Mm -hmm. Your hope is in his word. That's yes. right. Yes. Pedro. Well, I have a, uh, good experience with the psalm. I, I fell in love with my wife when she was proclaiming the psalm in the church, and she, she memorized the whole psalm and, wow. and gave it in the church as a presentation. Wow. It was amazing. But one of the psalms that I, I like is 133. Uh, Psalms 118, 133. It says, Direct my steps by your word, mm. and let no iniquity have dominion over me. Mm -hmm. And as we look into this step, that this, this beautiful psalm here is that we should live by God's guidance, right? We'll be looking for living righteous in Christ, and we should have the Word of God uh, direct our steps. Amen. Again, it's pointing back to the Word of God, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. That is the path to righteous mm -hmm. living. Mm -hmm. Zendili. Uh, I'm, I love the psalm just like everybody, but uh, verse 33 says, uh, which verse? Uh, one, chapter 119, verse 33. All right. Psalm 119, verse 33. And which version will you be reading from? Uh, NKJV. New All King right. James. New King James Version. Go ahead. It says, Teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and I shall keep it to the end. Mm. Uh, the whole psalm is more like David is asking God to teach him to make him. And uh, it is beautiful because we do not need any other teacher apart from God himself mm -hmm. to teach us his way so that we will keep it till the end. Going Amen. back to his word. Yes. Amen. All right, Sabina. Definitely, I think that one of my favorites is verse 105. And I'm also reading from the New King James Version. It says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Okay. Uh, and I think I just identify with that every day in my life, you know, we wake up, we have plans, but really every single step that we give, it's a step into the unknown, right? So uh, we thankfully have the Holy Spirit and God's word to cling to that helps and gives us light in our every step. And for me, this resonates a lot. This verse is one of my favorites in the Psalm. Amen. 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 All right. Anyone else before I move on to the next passage? Yes, Samuel. Uh, verse 11. All right. I'll be reading Psalm from 119. 119 and verse 11. And verse 11. Mm -hmm. 
Go I, ahead. I read from the uh, New American Standard uh, Bible. It says, Your word have I treasured in my heart that I may not sin against you. Mm. And it talks about the importance of having our minds filled with the word of God, not with the worldly entertainments, yeah. but with the word of God, because that is like a shield. Yeah. And how are the ways we can memorize the word of God? And one is through, you know, scripture songs. Mm -hmm. You know, as you go through life, you have temptations. You just repeat those psalms or sing those songs. And that definitely helps. Mm. Do you see a trend in some of the verses that you've shared? Many of the verses that you've shared today? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What is the trend? It's the, the word, word of God, of God. right? Mm -hmm. By beholding, we become changed. Mm -hmm. He changes us. He cleans us from the inside out. That's beautiful. That's one of the blessings, right? Mm -hmm. But let's take a look at some of the additional blessings. Psalm chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. And Travis, would you read that for us? Psalm chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. And I'll be reading from the New King James Version. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He should be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its seasons, whose leaf is also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. Hmm. What are some blessings of righteous living in that passage? Hmm. Gladys? I like the, 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 the progression. He's saying, blessed is the one who does not walk, who does not stand, and who does not sit, sit <laughs> with the evildoers. It's like it telling you, watch out when you're walking with people you shouldn't be walking watch out if you start hanging out with the wrong crowd it's like a warning for you for your living your daily living mm -hmm. and the blessing is what do you see the blessing Brittany? i love what it says at the end of verse three whatever he does shall prosper mm -hmm. so whether we speak whether we act mm -hmm. whatever what our work may be that god is going to make it prosper because we're drinking from his river of living water, mm -hmm. the tree planted in his word, mm -hmm. um, we're receiving from him and he's gonna make it prosper. Mm -hmm. Harold. Oh yeah, there's like so much like uh, imagery here, like mm -hmm. uh, planted by the streams of water. And I think of the blessing of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit has been associated like with water mm -hmm. and also b yielding fruits in its season. And I think of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And for every season of life, we do need that special fruit of the Holy Spirit, like goodness, kindness, gentleness, self-control. Mm -hmm. we, we can have different seasons in our life where we'll definitely need to depend on the Holy Spirit to help us mm -hmm. to go through those seasons of life. Yes, Sabina. And also in parallel to what Harold was sharing, especially here on verse three, uh, that says that this is a tree planted by rivers of water, that he is equating that to being close and receiving from the Holy Spirit. Really also in the illustration, we can see that this is a tree to which nothing really lacks mm -hmm. because this tree is planted by the source of its provision, right? So there, this is a tree that is not ever going to be thirsty. Mm -hmm. So I see that also in the journey of life, there is this wisdom that even if we're still waiting for the fruit to come, mm -hmm. right? Still we can count that in the, in the going, in the growth, the provision will keep coming, that we can just lean on God, that eventually, you know, the fruit will come and the, the signs of His prosperity are going to, to show in the provision, in the process, and in the bearing the fruit as well. Pedro. I know we've been talking about the tree. Here's an illustration of, of, of the Psalms. We found many trees in the Psalms, and mm -hmm. I see one important thing is purpose. You know, there's a comparison here in the Psalms about the chaff and the tree. Mm -hmm. You know, chaff can go wherever you want, right? By the wind and, and it's free as it looks like, but it's just chaff, there's nothing in it. But the tree nourishes and the tree, tree have purpose, even though we're not, we're, we're not moving as far that we might want it to as a, a free person will want it to be. God says, no, I want you to build purpose so you can grow taller and have uh, a better, overlook of life and a blessing to those around you and look at the tree it, it provides shades it provides fruits it provides healing and god wants us to be the trees uh, on this world by bringing uh, uh, wisdom and helpful living 
So as we come to a close, thank you, Pedro. As we come to a close, I'd like you to think, where have you seen, how have you seen the Lord bless your life by your choice to follow wise counsel based on his word? Hmm. Trisha Lee? Someone said that wisdom is gained by experience, but there are some experiences that God doesn't want us to experience at all. And mm -hmm. so when I think about my life and the choices I've made, I think about some friends, some loved ones who have had some very unfortunate experiences by not following God's word. And I'm grateful that God has kept me, not because I'm super smart, mm -hmm. not because I'm good or holy, that's but because of following his word and believing and trusting that. And mm. I, I see his blessing in my life because he has led me to avoid some of those pains, some of those hurts mm. that he doesn't want any of us to experience. So I thank God for his keeping power, his protecting power, mm. and that there's some wisdom that we don't have to get from the bad experiences of life. Amen. Mm. Thank you, Trisha Lee. I really appreciate that. We don't have to experience it in order to stay away from it and realize that it's bad. Mm. I love how the, the Word of God just transformed your character as you apply it, as you learn. Mm. Uh, I used to be very hot tempered and I love how just by studying His Word and I just kept praying, Lord, change me, make me more patient, make me more calm. And He is doing it every day when, while just mm memorizing his word and putting into practice. Thank you very much. We could continue our study, but what is the, what is the main theme that we've learned today? Mm. The word. Wisdom, the word. wisdom the word. from the word of God. All right, mm -hmm. thank you for studying with us. Thanks so much, Stephanie. And thank you for being with us for Hope Sabbath School today. And his word is indeed like that long scripture song, 176 verses. His word is a lamp to our feet and the light to our path. Let that be a blessing, His Word to guide you in righteous living. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are thankful for Your Word today. We've been admonished, even in our study, to hide Your Word in our hearts. We've been encouraged that the Word is not of any private interpretation, mm -hmm. but the Holy Spirit breathed upon those who wrote the Word. It's inspired scripture. Help us not only to hear the word, but to live the word. And as we've learned, not only to bless our lives, but to bless those around us. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, thanks for joining us for Hope Sabbath School. You say, oh, Derek, I just figured out why we study the Bible. <laughs> That's right. Most important to tell us of the God who loves us with an immeasurable, unfailing love, a Savior named Jesus who wants to transform our lives by His Spirit. What a journey. Go out and share that good news with those around you. A study in the Archives of General Psychiatry, August 2008, finds that children who do not get enough sleep are more likely to be overweight than their well-rested peers. The researchers determined that a one-hour reduction in daily REM sleep nearly tripled a child's odds for overweight and obesity. That's a fact. But there's hope. Bring back the bedtime story, prayers, and tuck-in time. Establishing a regular bedtime routine can ensure that your child gets adequate sleep and help to reduce their risk for obesity. So for the little ones, more sleep equals better fit.
Adventist education in Portugal, an alpine camp in Slovenia, and meeting Jesus by a campfire in Switzerland. All this and much more from the front lines of mission coming up next. Welcome to Mission 360, I'm Gary Krauss and today's program is coming to you from the beautiful mountains of Slovenia in former Yugoslavia. You know, there's something restorative, something healing about coming out into nature and on today's program we'll see a story of an alpine camp designed for mission. On today's program we're going to many parts of the world but first up we're going to Portugal to learn about a school that grew from two. Stephen N. Haskell was the first Seventh-day Adventist minister to visit Portugal. Haskell traveled around the world at the service of the General Conference to scout the conditions for mission advancement. During this worldwide trip, he arrived in Portugal in July 1889. Adventist work didn't begin until September 26, 1904, with the arrival of the first missionary couple from the United States to Lisbon, Portugal. Clarence Emerson, and Mary Haskell Renfro, along with her baby, were a young family with a passion to share the Adventist message. They began learning Portuguese, and soon after, they began selling Adventist literature, making missionary contacts and visits, and preaching. Since those humble beginnings, the Adventist church in Portugal has grown to around 10,000 members. But with 10 million people in the country, the mission challenges are still evident. It is difficult to share the gospel in the growing cities. People are busy, distracted, and interested in things outside of Christianity. One of the ways Adventists have built meaningful connections in Portugal is through education. The Setubal Adventist School opened in 1983. Lolita helped open the school and was its first teacher. She remembers how it started with only two students being taught in the church. And so it was Fernando and Georgie who first attended school here in Setúbal. From there, other children came. Many children came. At the end of the first year, we had 28 children and we continued. We were allowed to keep this open and many more children came to attend the school. They quickly outgrew the small church space until eventually the building next door became available and they moved in. Parents noticed that this school had more to offer than just the standard curriculum found at other schools. Students' development of Christian values has attracted families to grow an interest in the Adventist church over the years. We look at the school as a center of influence. It's a center of influence that works with our children, but also with children who are not from our church, who even belong to other churches. And this is the great method of work of this school, influencing these children and their families who come to church for special occasions. Some attend church regularly. And we have several cases of young people who have joined the Pathfinder Club and eventually were baptized. And that is why Pathfinders are exactly a complement to the church's educational project. Ultimately, they seek to educate for eternity. This church, at its base, clearly has a mission vision. 
aquilo que nós verificamos nesse... And what we have seen in these 40 years of work by this school in Setuba é exatamente uma ligação is a very strong connection between what school life is and the life of the church. Podemos transmitir não só às crianças We can transmit not only the knowledge of Jesus to children, but also to parents, guardians, who often attended church, and some children who ended up becoming Adventists, along with their parents. This small school in Portugal has big potential. Unfortunately, the space isn't big enough for the school to continue to expand, and they have few resources staff, students, and their families pray for a new building that can accommodate this school's potential. This quarter, a portion of your 13th Sabbath offerings will help construct a new school building in a fast-growing area of the city. This will allow more families to be impacted by Adventist education. Sempre a orar por a... I always pray for this school so that it can grow and develop. And who knows, one day we will be able to have a school with other, bigger, better facilities, with more conditions. And I think that is our objective. It's in my heart. This school is in my heart. Please pray with Lolita for this project. Thank you for supporting the 13th Sabbath offering that will impact the lives of families in Portugal. My guest is Gregor, who is a church member here in Slovenia. Thank you so much for joining us. Please tell me, how did you become a Christian and a Seventh-day Adventist? Wow, that's a very interesting story. I was, uh, basically, I was raised in a communist, in a strict communist family. And uh, I didn't believe in God till my 20s, something like that. Uh, I enrolled in some kind of problems and I decided to, to cut the problems by enrolling in army for six months. So the first day when I came to the army, I met an Adventist boy. And because we have, we had some quite similar hobbies, we befriended and so he told me everything about God, Bible, and by this I uh, became an uh, Adventist. And you were telling me that it wasn't so much what he preached. Oh yeah, of course. Uh, he didn't convince me uh, with theology but but with life so with with example uh we talked about different things and he really lived what he preached and and that's that what that what attracted me so much yeah beautiful now tell me about the outreach initiative that you have called alpine camp mm -hmm. how did this start and what is it well the alpine camp is a um, seven day outdoor camp with sport activities that the church in Slovenia organizes together with the Pathfinder Club Slovenia every year. Well, it started like that uh, the country that we live in is full of mountains and people like mountaineering. So a lot of people um, love to spend more, a lot of time in the mountains. And the idea came that we would combine the classic Alpine camp with a Pathfinder camp and so how, uh, somehow give the essence, the spiritual essence uh, to, to the, yeah, to this. Uh... Beautiful, now when did you start this? Well, we started in 2007. Okay. And, but this were just the first ideas of yes. how, but during the years we somehow molded uh, to what the Alpine camp is today. So who does this camp minister to? Who participates? Okay, in this camp, uh, the participants are from all very different grounds. They are from, coming from church, uh, they are coming from outside church, and, and as well people who live in the, in the environment. Let's say the guides, the, the mountain guides, and the stuff which uh, helps to maintain the camp is mostly from the church. Uh, some professional mountain guides are helping uh, just to implement some, some parts of the activities that we have. But the participants are church uh, members or let's say ex-church members and the people from, the, from Slovenia who wants to spend a week in the mountains. So it's something that's connecting not only for church members but also for the community. Yes. And uh, with the camp uh, every year, in our camp, we as well have the outreach 
uh, one day outreach to the community, to serve the community where we, we are camping uh, as well. So it's good for the, the youth in the church and the people from the church, the, the people who invite, who are invited to the camp and the surrounding people who live nearby there. So tell me about the outreach activities that you do during the camp. Okay, you mean for the people outside? In the community, yes. Oh, for the community. So uh, in the nearby city, uh, we pitch uh, some tables and we do the outreach program, the health outreach program, with counseling uh, on, on, on the diet and everything, distributing different books. And on the other side, we do uh, Adra Day, when we find the uh, elderly, elderly vulnerable people who live in the houses and they are not able to care for the environment or the house anymore. So we do one day work uh, to helping them with every, repairing the house or, or cleaning the environment or something like that. So it seems to me that it's a, a wonderful opportunity for discipleship, particularly for younger people who come to the camp, but also they can invite their friends and it's not going to be, we're going to be preaching at you, but it's an opportunity for them to be touched spiritually. Yes, basically it's a seven day, uh, seven day evangelism in a practical way. Although we always have pastor yes. uh, in our camp and we have morning and evening worship services. And during the day, you know, sometimes we have some Bible studies and this and that. So there is uh, uh, influence of that as well. Because you face a challenge here in Slovenia, as you do throughout Europe, of the increase in secularism and people who no longer believe in God. Yes, but people are still thirsty. They still look for the essence. They are looking for God. They just don't know or they don't find the right path to that. And that is why we need to meet people where they are uh, in, their, uh, in different environments. So what are your hopes for the church here in Slovenia? What, what do you want to see happen? Uh, excuse me, what, do you... what is your hopes, your hope for the church here? What would you like to see happen in the future? In the future? Well, we would like to, to become really approachable to the people who are, who are living in our culture. And as I said before, meet them where they are, meet their needs and show them path to Jesus. Yeah. So if I were to come to the Alpine camp, what sort of activities could I be involved in? Well, you could be involved in different activities because on this camp, uh, we have a big scoop of different people who, which are attending. We even have, we have elderly people, we have young families, we have youths. And let's say the activities are like, because we are in the, in the Alps, we spend each year two or three days hiking and in the other days, we have different social activities like social games and we have workshops, uh, survival workshops, how to survive in this terrain, like moving in the mountains, uh, spending night in the open, uh, how to use wild food orientation, first aid. Normally, we have one day in the morning, we have all those workshops and then we give uh, participants lists of things they need to pack. And then we go to the mountains for two days. So they need practically implement what they heard on the workshops. But this is not obligatory for everybody because um, all participants who, who are coming to this have their own uh, choice. What will they do? This, was, this is just one of the options. Um, because we are nearby the river, people can stay all day reading books, those who want or they go to some tourist sightseeing tours that we organize. Well, normally we have three different activities for day. Let's say one day we go rock climbing, we go on tourist sightseeing, or people are just playing volleyball uh, in the camp or doing some activities like that. So we want to touch each one of them. We have even, if I say people who don't want to go to the mountains, but they stay all week with us, with the river and with the book. And Wonderful. Enjoy. Sign me up. I'm coming. <laughs> okay, you're welcome. <laughs> Thank you so much, Gregor. Thank you. <laughs> and viewers at home, the Alpine Camp is just a, another example of putting Christ's method into ministry where we can actually connect with people in their interests and their needs and provide a spiritual framework for them, particularly in a country where 
people are very resistant to outright straight preaching. We'll be right back straight after this break. Welcome back to the mountains of Slovenia and mountains are very important in the lives of people in this country. In fact, more than 100,000 people are actively involved in alpine clubs coming to hike and climb the mountains uh, in these beautiful regions throughout the country. Well, next up, we're going to South America and talking to Pastor Bill Crispy, who is the Adventist Mission Director there, about the mission challenges in that region, but also what they are doing for mission around the world. I'm here in South America with Pastor Bill Quispe, who is the Adventist Mission Director for South America. And we'd like to talk with him a little bit about what's happening in mission here. Pastor, what is happening in mission in South America? The church in South America is aware of its local and world mission, and through different initiatives, the church in South America promotes the world mission. One of them, for example, is the Caleb Mission Project, which is a project that motivates youth in South America every year to dedicate their vacations, to preach the gospel in places that are distant from their local church. And it is impressive because every year at least 70,000 young people are mobilized throughout South America to preach using the method of Christ and planting new churches. The second project is the Colombo Adventist Service, and I am very moved to know that in the last seven years, more than a thousand young people have left South America to serve around the world, impacting more than 40 countries. And it is a great thrill to see that the young people have a world mission consciousness, and the meetings throughout South American Congresses promote and train young people to serve worldwide. South American conferences promote and empower young people in their calling. In the I Will Go meetings that take place every two years in South America, with guests coming from different parts of the world, motivate and train young people and also university students to go out as volunteers to challenging places. For example, like the 1040 window. It is a great emotion to see how young people are the hope of the missionary work. So now, We've also been told to go into all the world. What is South America doing for the rest of the world? As we mentioned earlier, in the last seven years, more than a thousand young missionary volunteers were sent through the entity system. It comprises the Adventist Voluntary Service, and it's exciting to see the commitment of the young people with the world mission. More than a thousand young people in the last seven years reaching out to serve in more than 40 countries. It's really exciting. In addition to that, Adventist Volunteer Service Project, also in South America, the pastoral body takes a challenge. Under the leadership of Pastor Erton, 25 pastors were sent in the last years to challenging places like the Window 1040 to be able to serve in those places. And this is a great emotion because it is a commitment not only from the church but also from the pastoral body. Now, you've had many mission conferences for young people. Um, what, ha what kind of reaction are you getting from young people? We are very happy to see the youth willing to serve God. In the different seminars, meetings and training or missionary congresses that are held here in South America, we saw a very positive response from the young people and an example of them is what we are experiencing in the international I Will Go meetings, which aim to train young people to be able to serve in their locality and worldwide. Every two years, the universities of South America choose places to gather sometimes 4,000 young people, 5,000 young people to train them, challenge them, 
motivate them and place in their hearts the world mission. The response is very positive and we thank God for that, because the youth in South America vibrates with the mission. Now why has South America responded in this way and what could this do to encourage other divisions to do something similar? Many years ago, American missionaries came to South America to bring us the gospel. Today the mission work in South America has grown, the church has multiplied, and one way to repay this great favor that the church in the United States did for South America is now to send missionaries to the world. The question is no longer who will come to South America, but who will go out of South America. We are very happy because the commitment in South America is total, 100% with the mission and the challenges that the World Church has for the gospel to be preached throughout the world. Remember, the question in South America is no longer who will come, but who will go outside of South America. Wonderful. Do you have any stories you can share about something that's happened here in South America or other parts of the world? At the South American level, we have hundreds of disciples committed to the local mission, church planting and personal evangelism. At this moment, I remember a missionary sister from northern Peru. Her name is Berta. She was baptized 18 years ago. She assumed the commitment to be a missionary. Helen White says that every true disciple is born in the kingdom of God as a missionary. And she was really born as a missionary because from the moment she was baptized, she took the challenge and placed the goal in her life to bring 10 souls for Jesus in that year. And by the grace of God, she brought 10 souls for Christ and she became passionate about this mission. And she, from the moment she was baptized, she has not stopped until today. Every year she has a goal. The other day I was talking to her and she told me, Pastor, my goal for this year is 30 souls. And Pastor, I'm already at 28. I am missing two souls. It is exciting to see the missionary spirit in action. An incident occurred during the pandemic. The goal was 30 souls because her goal is 30 souls every year. She called me and she said, because of the pandemic, it has been very difficult to give Bible studies. I am not very tech savvy, but I learned how to use WhatsApp to give Bible studies online. And she said to me, Pastor, the year is ending. I did not reach my goal of 30 souls. I tell her, Sister, how many did you baptize? I achieved 28. Wow, I told her, Sister, you're, it's excellent in the pandemic. You got 28 souls for Jesus. Yes, Pastor. Brothers like Berta, there are so many in South America that plant churches, they win souls. And what the sister left in my mind, the time I met her, she told me, Pastor, I am a missionary, and in my free time, I'm an agricultural engineer, because she is an agricultural engineer, but she says, I'm a missionary, and in my free time, I work as an agricultural engineer. What a commitment to the mission. She is a passionate woman who represents the missionary spirit of the brotherhood here in South America. And she says a phrase that she repeats when she gives her testimony. My dream is to fill heaven with souls. What a blessing to see women, men, young people committed to bringing souls to Jesus. It's wonderful to see how God is still leading His work. Thank you so much for talking with us today. Welcome back to Slovenia and next up we travel not too far from here to Switzerland and meeting Jesus by a campfire. On the shores of Lake Geneva, a Seventh-day Adventist summer camp has touched the hearts and lives of young people in Switzerland. During the summer, Adriana works at La Plage because of the positive memories she has of being a camper. I 
We had times when we were hanging out by the lake, chatting around a campfire. It allows you to be with a person or with several people, but to be able to exchange experiences, to share our struggles, to have special moments with each other, and to encourage each other. Campers spend the days doing fun activities like water sports on the lake, but also prioritize developing a deeper connection with Jesus. I think that having these experiences, it made me grow enormously, whether here at camp or in general life. The programs, everything that the leaders, the pastors and so on provide, it allows you to develop your spiritual life as a child and as a young adult. It allows me even today as an adult to develop a relationship with God. In fact, that's what happens a lot here. Adriana has seen multiple people give their hearts to Jesus and be baptized in the lake because of the experiences at camp. It gives me chills thinking about it. We realize to what extent we have a God who is present, who is great, and who is with us every moment. These experiences allow us to really realize the presence of God in our lives. The camp sits between two cities, Geneva and Luzon, making it centrally located for many to attend. Private access to the lake provides a safe way for them to enjoy the water. With years of fun and spiritual growth this camp has provided, time has taken a toll on the facilities. Programs can only operate in the warmer months due to the piping and plumbing. In the colder months, the pipes freeze, making the kitchen and bathroom areas unusable. Another limitation is the kitchen. This small space needs an update with a proper area for food storage, a better layout, and new appliances. With these improvements, the camp would be able to operate year-round, opening new opportunities. This quarter, a portion of your 13th Sabbath offering will go to the renovations of La Plage. Your contribution will allow a wider range of programs to be offered year-round. Please pray for this project in Switzerland. Thank you for your support of the offering that makes a difference in the lives of people like Adriana. Well, thank you so much for joining us on today's program. And I hope that you've been inspired and challenged by our Mission 360 degree view of mission around the world. We see many mission challenges today. We see the 1040 window where most of the world's population live. It's the home to the major world religions. But this is where the Christian church and the Adventist church has had least impact. 60% of the world's population. But then we travel to places such as Europe. Right here we have a huge mission challenge with the growth of secularism, the growth of post-Christianity, where people feel as if they're rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. And so I want you to please continue to pray for the mission here in Europe. Well, and I wanna thank you for the way that you continue to support mission through your prayers, through your donations to Global Mission and your personal involvement. Well, for Adventist Mission, I'm Gary Kraus, and I hope that you can join me next time right here on Mission 360.
responsible for something good ending. <laughs> but welcome and happy Sabbath, everyone. It is good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Amen. I don't know if uh, you are like me, and I was even talking with Brother Simba like him, where you woke up today, you looked outside, and with the weather that we ha are having, if you hadn't checked your, your app or the, the weather channel earlier this week, you thought, wow, it's going to be nice and warm outside today. But we have another, hopefully, last little bit of cold here to endure but it is, it is good to be in the, the warm house of God today. And uh, we know that he is uh, blessing us. And if you, you came here and you, you had a tough week, today is the day, now is the time where you can just take a deep breath and thank God that you are here and you can just rest in the day, in the Sabbath rest that he's given us. Amen? Amen. Now, I don't know if you know this, but if you're visiting us for the first time here today, Hamilton Mountain is your new home. If you're looking for a church out there and you're saying uh, you're new to the city or you're going to be new to the city here um, and you're saying, well, maybe I'm going to go around and see the different churches. Well, you don't need to go any further. God has brought you here for a reason today because this is the place where Jesus is making things happen. Amen. So I want to know today, are there any visitors in the house? If there's any visitors, can you raise your hand? Do we have any visitors today? Just in the back here? Can you stand up, my brother? What's your name? Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Peter? Yeah. Excellent. Well, brother Peter, where are you visiting us from? Nairobi, Kenya. Amen. And are you staying in Hamilton now? Yes. Well, we welcome you all the way from Nairobi, Kenya, Brother Peter. Let's welcome him today, church. Amen. You may be seated. Do you have any other visitors here? Yes. Can you stand up? What is your name, my sister? Samantha. Sister Samantha. And where are you visiting from? Niagara Falls, so not too far. So whenever you want to make that long trip uh, that isn't too long, you're welcome here at Hamilton Mountain. Amen? Amen. 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 Thank you. Please send our greetings to the brothers and sisters in Niagara Falls when you return. And do we have any other visitors today? No? Okay. Any in the back? No? Okay. Well, we're so glad that you're with us today. And at this moment, we're just going to uh, look to our neighbor. If you want to get up, you can uh, say hello, ha wish them happy Sabbath. And uh, after that, uh, Brother uh, Brennan will come up with the announcements. But happy Sabbath, everyone. <laughs> Again, happy Sabbath, church. Just got a few announcements here today. Um, this month we've been, um, Black History Month, we've been highlighting a, a hero, I guess, in black history. So today's feature is Barry Black. Barry Clayton Black is the 62nd 
chaplain of the United States Senate. He began serving as the Senate chaplain on January 27, 2003, becoming the first African American and Seventh Day Adventist to hold this office. In 1995, Black was chosen from 127 nominees for the NAACP renowned service award for his contributions to equal opportunity and civil rights. In 2002, he received the Benjamin Elijah Mays Distinguished Leadership Award from the Morehouse School of Religion in 2004. The Old Dominion University chapter of the NAACP conferred him uh, the Image Award, reaffirming the dream, realizing the vision um, for military excellence. On May 23rd, 2019, Black was awarded the Beckett's 2019 Canterbury Medal for his defense of religious liberty for the people of all faiths. Uh, Black is a potent example of a Seventh-day Adventist and how one can glorify God in their personal and professional lives, especially while navigating deeply divided and, um, sorry, deeply divided partisan world. So, um, as you've seen um, here, number eight in the bulletin, we have our tax receipts available uh, by the Treasury Department, and they are available in the deacon's room that is, I guess, to my right, right behind you. So if you have a tax receipt that you're looking for, um, go knock on that door and give your name, and they will be able to help you out. Uh, March 9th, um, there is an ACF Cornerstone event. Um, it's at McMaster's, you can see here. Um, the food registration closes actually today, so if you want to be a part of that event and receive a lunch, you have to get that registration in by today. And also, here's an important one, uh, the bulletin and um, say these announcements that I'm making right now, there is a, a deadline, as you can see in item number 12 here. So these things need to be in by Wednesday evening uh, in order to give enough time for the media team and communication team to put these uh, together in here. So um, if you have a late request for announcement, it might not happen for you. Um, choir members, uh, or those interested in joining the choir, there's gonna be a meeting after uh, church here in the sanctuary. I believe you can find uh, Sister Gay or Brother Simba. And um, right now we have a, a video queued up about the ministry convention for March uh, 22nd, 23rd. Experience spiritual enrichment at the ministry's convention featuring a lineup of renowned speakers. Be there to engage in captivating workshops designed to elevate every dimension of your ministry. Don't miss out on this transformative opportunity to be inspired. This will lead you to have greater connection with Christ, with fellow believers, and with your community. Come and be inspired to take your service to God to the next level. Be inspired, connect, network, fellowship, and grow at Ministries Convention. I look forward to seeing you there. Amen. So again, the early bird registration has been extended to Monday. I've been really pushing this, especially with our board members. There are some great seminars, and, and we encourage all of you, even if you don't have a position, because nominating committee is coming up this year, and we always say it becomes cliche that, you know, 20% of the people do 80% of the work, or we shouldn't come to the church just expecting to warm the pews. Each one of you here has been gifted by God, by the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen? The same Holy Spirit that lives in me lives in you. The same Holy Spirit that carried our Lord forward to preach the gospel, heal the sick, break the chains of those who were oppressed, uh, give sight to the blind. That same Holy Spirit lives in you. And conventions like these, they help us become more aware of how the Spirit wants to use us in the church so that not just a select few 
are doing the work, but each one of us here are called, like the General Conference, they've had an initiative over the past several years, total member involvement. We want each of our members to be involved at Hamilton Mountain, amen? Because, oh, we want each of our members to be involved at Hamilton Mountain. Amen. 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 I know it might put you out of your comfort zone. Maybe you're, you've been burnt out. But don't underestimate how God can revitalize your life by being active in service for his kingdom. So Monday, again, the early bird registration ends. And then on Tuesday, if you sign up, it will go from 75 to 95. And you can't call me to ask uh, if the registration can go back to 75 because I'm not the conference president, nor do I ever want to be. So, uh, <laughs> so anyway, but with that being said, let's uh, stand and, and pray together for the opening prayer. Father in heaven, this is the day that you have made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Father, as the sun is shining in this sanctuary today, we pray that the light of your son Jesus would shine in our hearts. Father, if we have been sick or burdened uh, with, with illness or chronic pain, today, Lord, we cast that care upon you. If we have struggled with wondering how we will make ends meet, Father, today we know you are Jehovah Jireh, the God who will provide for us, but at this moment, we rest in you and we give that care to you as well. If we have been spiritually weak and famished throughout the week, we pray that through our praise and worship, the prayers offered, the words spoken, that you would revive our hearts this day. May we worship you as our King of Kings, our Lord of Lords, and may the spirit that you have placed in each of us shine out from within our hearts, proclaiming that you are a God who is love. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. At this time, you can be, be uh, seated, um, or hold on, opening song, and then, so sorry about that, I'm just giving you some exercise, you can stand. <laughs> yeah, please remain standing as we go to our opening song, Number 100, Great is Thy Faithfulness.
happened. Uh, I, I, was, I was asking uh, Brendan to do the second reading for me, but he, he vanished, so it's okay. I, I didn't want to do it for myself, but uh, it's, it's the second reading, as you'll see in your book. You're here. Oh, I already started. So okay, it, it's okay. okay. Yeah. It, uh, the second reading for myself, uh, my wife Cassandra Kern, uh, my daughter Lydia Kern, uh, moving from Ottawa East. Um, to, uh, to Hamilton Mountain here. If you would still have me as your pastor, uh, I will ask if there is a motion. It's moved. Is there a second? All in favor? Amen. Amen. Oh, the majority has spoken. You're not getting rid of me yet for those who didn't vote. Any opposed? All right. It carries. All right. So at this time, too, at this time, um, we have a, uh, a high Sabbath because we have uh, members in our midst that are not on the books, but are going to officially become members of the Hamilton Mountain Church today through profession of faith. So I want to invite uh, wherever they're sitting to come up here and, and join me uh, on the platform. Um, Sister uh, Yvonne, uh, Sister uh, Tando, uh, Brother Everton, uh, Brother Marco, uh, come forward, um, amen, and uh, there, there is, I'm not going to go into everyone's uh, story today, but uh, there, there is a mixed uh, multitude in terms of the reason for uh, the profession of faith. Sometimes, uh, as some of you may know, that we, we put out uh, requests when we're told from, from members that they want to move their membership here to Hamilton Mountain, amen. Um, but we try to contact the church, uh, and it's usually somewhere that's not in North America, and months and sometimes even years pass and we don't hear anything and the only way we can get someone on the books is through profession of faith. So we have a couple of members that are coming in through profession of faith uh, this way today. Um, but also uh, there are times in our life where either we, we walk away from the Lord and we return to him. Um, sometimes we as a church, and I have to say, from some stories I've heard, we have let people down, even many, many years ago. And as a pastor, I, I, I say sorry when we, as, as a church, we've let our brothers and sisters down. But praise the Lord that even when we are unfaithful, he remains faithful, as the Bible declares. And he still holds on and is, it has, has it reached out to our brothers and sisters. And, and sometimes um, people come to me and they say, why I'm bringing this up is because sometimes they say, Pastor, I want to be rebaptized. And I will ask them in sincerity, and it's not that I'll deny anyone who wants to be rebaptized rebaptism, uh, but we have some here today where we've had that conversation on the phone and um, 
I, I say, okay, when you were first baptized, though, when you were first baptized, did you believe in the Lord Jesus? Were, were, you, were you not just doing it because your friends did it? You were going along? Because that happens sometimes. And, that, and that's just going for a swim when you're just getting baptized because someone else did. But when you really love the Lord and you realize that he loves you, you don't have to have a master's in divinity or anything like that. That baptism is meaningful. Amen? Amen. And we don't practice as some denominations or in my former uh, tradition where we think the waters of baptism, when we have baptism, that those waters are holy. It is symbolic of the fact that our lives have been buried in the grave with Jesus. Amen? And when we come up out of the grave, we are saying the old man is put away. And you know what? Sometimes that old man, even after we come out of that watery grave, rears their ugly head. I've never met someone coming up out of the waters that is immediately perfect in terms of the rest of their life, if, if, if there is time. Mind you, when we confess our sins, the slate is clean. We're already seen as perfect in the beloved, Hebrews 10, 14. But why I'm saying this is sometimes we have led people to believe that they need to commit some form of work, including making baptism a work in order to be clean again. But when we practice foot washing, we're reminded that the words that Jesus spoke over us, the, the intercession that he makes for us now as our high, high priest, blotting out our sins, it is enough. So if you ever want to be rebaptized, amen, come and talk to me. But don't think necessarily that your first baptism is negated because you had a season in your life where you departed from the Lord. What was represented in that first baptism still carries forward to this day when you repent and you confess and believe in the Lord Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen. So that is some of the cases today. So whether it's we couldn't find your name or we, we, we did you wrong or you're returning to the Lord this day or a combination of some of that, today we rejoice as a church family because the family is growing. Amen? Amen. So I'm going to uh, read uh, the commitments here for the profession of faith. And when I read these, uh, all you just have to say is, I do. And church family, this is an opportunity for you as well. When our candidates up here, um, from Brother uh, Marco to Sister Yvonne to Sister Tando to Brother Everton, um, they're up here and they say, I do. You also can join them in saying, I do, reaffirming your commitment to the Lord. So I'll start in the beginning here. It says, I believe there is one God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, a unity of three co-eternal persons. Amen. Amen. I accept the death of Jesus Christ on Calvary as the atoning sacrifice for my sins and believe that through faith in his shed blood, I am saved from sin and its penalty. I do. Amen. I renounce the world and its sinful ways and have accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior, believing that God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven my sins and given me a new heart. I Amen. I accept by faith the righteousness of Christ, my intercessor in the heavenly sanctuary, and accept his promise of transforming grace and power to live a loving, Christ-centered life in my home and before the world. Amen. I believe that the Bible is God's inspired word, the only rule of faith and practice for the Christian, and I covenant to spend time regularly in prayer and Bible study. I Amen. I accept the Ten Commandments as a transcript of the character of God and the revelation of his will. It is my purpose by the power of the indwelling Christ to keep this law, including the fourth commandment, which requires the observance of the seventh day of the week as the Sabbath of the Lord and the memorial of creation. I Amen. I look forward to the soon coming of Jesus and the blessed hope when this mortal shall put on immortality. As I prepare to meet the Lord, I will witness to his loving salvation and by life and word help others to be ready for his glorious appearing. I Amen. I accept the, bi the biblical teaching of spiritual gifts and believe that the gift of prophecy is one of the identifying marks of the remnant church. Amen. I believe in church organization 
It is my purpose to support the church by my tithes and offerings and by my personal effort and influence. Amen. I believe that my body is the temple of the Holy Spirit and will honor God by caring for it, avoiding the use of that which is harmful, abstaining from all unclean foods, from the use, manufacture, or sale of alcoholic beverages, the use and manufacture or sale of tobacco in any of its forms for human consumption, and from the misuse of or trafficking in narcotics or other drugs. Amen. Amen. I know and understand the fundamental Bible principles as taught by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I purpose, by the grace of God, to fulfill his will by ordering my life in harmony with these principles. Amen. Amen. I accept the New Testament teaching of baptism by immersion and have been so baptized as a public expression of faith in Christ and his forgiveness of my sins. Amen. I accept and believe that the Seventh-day Adventist Church is the remnant church of Bible prophecy and that people of every nation, race, and language are invited and accepted into its fellowship. And I desire to be a member of this local congregation of the World Church, the Hamilton Mountain Seventh-day Adventist Church. Amen. At this time, let us congratulate and welcome the new members of the family. just want to offer a prayer for uh, the candidates here. Father in heaven, I thank you that these, your children, your sons and daughters standing with me on this platform have been accepted in the beloved, in your son Jesus, long before we had this profession of faith. But we are so thankful to you, oh God, this day as a church family. Whether this is us helping them move their membership here or a time where it is a, a time of recommitment to you or both, that you have allowed us to see you at work in our brothers' and sisters' lives. I pray, Lord, that through the indwelling Spirit, your Holy Spirit in each of them, that you will use them as more than just members on a page or an online database. Father, that you would show us Jesus in Brother Marco's life, in Sister Yvonne's life, in Sister Tando's life, and Brother Everton's life, O oh God. We have seen Jesus in them, and may we continue to see Jesus more and more as they grow in grace before you and their fellow brothers and sisters. Bless them now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 You may be seated. Bless you. And at this time, uh, we're going to invite, and some are already on the ball, raring to go. You're saying, why have you been talking so long, Anthony? Well, come on up, children. If you've been waiting, it is time for the children's story at this time. Come forward. Good morning, boys and girls. Ooh, let's try that again. Good morning, boys and girls. Good morning. All right, all right. So today's story is called Mr. Brown and the Reese's Pieces Peanut Butter Candy. Anybody have a favorite chocolate? Yes. OK, just tell me one. What's your favorite chocolate? I forgot the name of it. Okay. Does it have caramel? Does it have any fruits? Any describe? It's like when you eat it, and inside it's like all bubbly. Uh -huh. Arrow. 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 Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, Island Bar. It has caramel, um, and some 
coconut inside? Um, Tootsie Roll. Chocolate milk. Um, marshmallow chocolate. Anyone else? Arrow and milk cook bar, and my favorite candy is bubble gum. Okay. All right. So, this story, as I said, is called Mr. Brown and the Reese's Pieces Peanut Butter. So, in this story, Mr. Brown is an elderly man. He lives on his own and um, he gets the types of services where um, any of his meals that he needs is delivered or any of his groceries are also delivered to his home. Um, Mr. Reese didn't have any kids and um, also in this story there is um, a character named Isabella. Now Isabella was a single mom and she worked part-time at the grocery store. So um, one day, Mr. Brown decided that he was going to take a walk in his neighborhood, and he passed by the local grocery store. And for whatever reason, he decided that he was going to go in the grocery store just to look around and see what's in there. And when he went there, he saw the, um, the cashier, Isabella. And he noticed that you know she always wore a smile on her face. She seemed to be very pleasant to all the people that she was checking out at the grocery store. So Mr. Brown said, hmm, I want to approach her, but, I didn't know, but he didn't know how to, because he really didn't need anything in the grocery store because he got everything delivered to him. So Mr. Brown decided to pick up a chocolate bar. What do you think that was? The Reese's. All right, so he picked up the chocolate bar and he approached Ila Isabella and Isabella said, you know, good morning, how are you, how's your day? And uh, the one thing with um, Mr. Brown is that because he was a little bit, um, because he was a little bit older, you know, his coordination, hand coordination wasn't the best. So when he tried to take out the money to give to her to pay for the chocolate bar, his hands would shake. And so he had all these coins and they would drop on the floor and he had a hard time passing the money to um, Isabella. Now, I don't know if you've ever gone grocery shopping with your, no questions right now. So, <laughs> okay, what's the statement? When I was younger, my grandpa used to have shingles so he couldn't be able to drive us to school. Oh, okay. So, um, now, if you have any of you guys just with the raise of hand, have you ever gone to the grocery store with your parents? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, do you ever look at the line and see which line is going the fastest? Yeah. Okay. So, in this situation, because Mr. Brown had a difficult time, the line that he was in took a lot longer because he had to pick up all the change that he was dropping on the floor. And some of the people who were in the line behind him start to get very frustrated. They were rolling their eyes like, oh, come on. They were looking at their watch. And Isabel noticed that the people were getting a bit frustrated. So um, what she did when she noticed that he came back to buy um, some chocolate bar, she took her uh, little sign. So there's a sign sometimes that the cashiers put at the end. And it says, close, um, go to the next line. So every time Mr. Brown would come to um, her checkout, she would put that sign there. And then what she would do is when his hands are shaking, what she did was she would take, she would put her hands underneath his and that way it wouldn't shake and then she would help to take the money out. And during that time, they would, you know, she would talk to him briefly, not like 15 minutes or 20 because she was working, but she would take the time to get to know Mr. Brown. And so over a period of time, Mr. Brown would come once a week then he would come twice a week, then he would come three times a week. And the only thing he kept buying was this peanut butter Reese's Pieces candy. So one day, uh, Isabel noticed that Mr. Brown wasn't coming to the grocery store. One week went by, two weeks went by, three, we three weeks a month. And she started to wonder if he was okay, what was going on. Now Isabel remembered that in one of their conversations, Mr. Brown had told her where he had lived. 
And so she hesitated a little because she didn't want to just show up at somebody's house. But then she, she was really concerned about him. So she went walking in the neighborhood and she looked out for the houses and she saw the house, what, how he had described his house. And she went and she knocked on the door and somebody answered. And she's like, hi, um, my name is Isabella. I was wondering if uh, uh, Mr. Brown lives here. And so the person said, no, uh, Mr. Brown doesn't live here. Actually, we just moved in not too long ago. Um, but I remember that the person who sold us the house, um, that the person who sold the house had uh, Mr. Brown in the paper. But unfortunately, what he told Isabella was that Mr. Brown had passed away. So um, she, she was a little sad. And then he said, hold on a minute. I'm just going to go and get something and bring it back. He said, your name's Isabella, right? She said, yes. So the person left, and they came back with a note and a big box. And so he gave it to her, and he said, um, when I moved in here, this box was left here with this note that says to Isabella. I think Mr. Brown would want you to have this. So Isabella took it and she went home and then she opened up the box. What do you think was in the box? His Reese's Pieces book. Ah, so the box was full of a whole bunch of Reese's Pieces. And she opened up the note and she read. It says, Dear Isabella, this box is full of Reese's Pieces. You may be wondering why there's so much in there. Well, the truth is, I'm actually allergic to peanut butter. I didn't really need the Reese's Pieces, but I saw it as an opportunity to meet you and have a conversation with you. I want to thank you for the time that you took to get to know me, as I didn't have many kids. I didn't have kids at all, and I didn't know a lot of people in my community. And a lot of times I stayed home. I was very lonely. But your smile every time I came it filled my heart and it made me feel good. And even though you saw that I was struggling to give you the money, you were patient with me and you helped me. So that was a note that he, um, that he gave her. And also with the note was a check because he knew that Isabella was a single mom and that she struggled a little um, trying to take care of herself and her kids. So again, Mr. Brown did not have kids. So what he did was he left a check and he made the check. Um, now, if you guys don't know what checks, you can you have a certain amount of time to, to cash a check to get the money. So he dated it far enough that when he thought Isabella might come looking, and that's how sure he was of who Isabella was as a person, that he dated the check long enough that when she got it, she would be able to cash it. And the check was for $5,000. So he left some of the money that he had and he gave it to Isabella. So this, this, this story, boys and girls, do you, now all the stories you've been listening to for the past uh, month and last month has had one particular focus or theme. Do you know what that, what that theme is? Kindness and giving? Close. Love? Love. So we have been, all the children's stories that you guys have been hearing, boys and girls, has been about love. And the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4, that love is kind and love is patient. And boys and girls, you have the opportunity to show ways in which you love one another. And sometimes it doesn't have to be verbal. It doesn't have to be something big. It could just be taking the time to be loving and patient and kind to somebody. And this is what Isabel did. She didn't do anything big or special, but she saw an opportunity to get to know somebody and to make them not feel very uncomfortable in their grocery store. And that led to, you know, in ways it led to God also blessing Isabel for being um, an instrument of love towards somebody else. So as you go through the coming week, I want you to think about ways in which you can be patient and be kind so that you can show the love of God to others, okay? Did anyone take away anything from this story or want to share anything? 
No? Okay, so we'll end off with prayer. Who wants to pray? Okay, we'll have two prayers. Okay, if you could close your eyes and bow your head. Dear Jesus, do you remember and please and 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 thank for the stage and to your neighbor, amen. Dear Jesus, thank you for this wonderful day that you gave us and please help us as we have a good day today and please help us all to be good. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, so go back to your seats very quietly. Happy Sabbath, oh. okay. Happy Sabbath Church. Today's offering is for the local conference advance. Our offertory reading is given by Miss Heather Thompson Day, who writes, the other day I sat down on a plane and listened carefully as the flight attendant gave the safety instructions for the flight. Though I have flown before, that day, the words in the safety demonstration struck me as I listened. The flight attendant said the typical line about what to do in case of an emergency in which there's a loss in air pressure in the plane, which is to put your mask on first before stopping to help those around you. Clearly, even in our daily lives, we are best able to give back when we first take time to steward our own health, finances, and relationships, among other things. The word of God says, each of you should use whatever gifts you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides. 1 Peter 4, verse 10 and 11. What gifts has God given you? Think back on this week and consider what ways the Lord has blessed you, your family, or maybe your work. Now think about what you can be as a blessing to those around you. Our conference advance goes to support the network of churches in our region so we can be God's hands and feet through ministries like evangelism and summer camps. Today, let's give with open hearts. Can the deacons please come forward? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, grant us the strength and humility to serve others selflessly, following the example of your Son, Jesus Christ. Help us to recognize and embrace the opportunities to extend a helping hand, showing love and compassion to those in need. May we always be grateful for the abundant gifts you have bestowed upon us, the gift of life, health, family, friends, and talents. Help us to use these blessings to bring joy and fulfillment to others, spreading your life and grace wherever we go. Guide us to see the beauty in every soul, regardless of their circumstances, and inspire us to be instruments of your peace and love in a world that often feels divided and troubled. Thank you, Lord, for your unwavering love and constant presence in our lives. May we serve others with gladness and gratitude, knowing that in serving them, we are serving you. Amen.
Good morning, happy Sabbath. Today's scripture reading will be from uh, Jeremiah 48. (laughs) 
Jeremiah 48, verse 13 to 17 says, At last, Moab will be ashamed of his idol, Chemosh, as the people of Israel were ashamed of their golden calf of, at Bethel. He used to boast, We are heroes, mighty men of war, but now Moab and his towns will be destroyed. His promising youth are doomed to slaughter, says the king, whose name is, uh, who's, who says the king, whose name is the Lord of Heaven's armies. Destruction is coming for, fast from Moab. Calamity threatens ominously. You friends of Moab, weep and cry. See how the strong scepter is broken and how the beautiful staff is shattered. Happy Sabbath, church. Happy Sabbath. It's, um, it's time for a garden of prayer. And we usually invite the church members to come down to the front to pray. But what I'd like to do for a moment is just tell you why. Because sometimes, even as Christians, you go through difficult times. And I don't know what your week was like this week, but God knows. And so what we like to do is, is to invite you to come down. If you have something special you want to present to God, the best place to be is at the feet of Jesus. And so if you want to come down to the altar, I want to invite you down as we lift our hearts to God in prayer. And those of you who are not coming, please kneel where you are if possible so we can pray. Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name this morning, dear God. In your name there is power. In your name, Father, there is forgiveness. In your name, dear God, there is grace. In your name there is mercy. And so, God, we come before you this morning shouting, hallowed be your name. Father, we recognize today that we are not even worthy to still use the words, hallowed be your name. But we thank you that one day, a long time ago, you went to Calvary's cross and gave us the opportunity as Paul said, to come boldly to the throne of grace and we can shout aloud because we are covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. Hallowed be your name. Amen. This morning, God, your church bow before you. Father, your church bow before you because you've given us that grace. You've given us health. You've given us strength. You've given us wisdom. You've given us understanding. You, put, you place food on our tables. We've got so much to be grateful for today, dear God. So we come before you thanking you this morning, Jesus. And Lord, at the same time, with broken hearts, we remember those who do not have anything. Father, with broken hearts, remember those who, right now, as we speak, there are bombs falling in the homes. Father, right now, as we speak, remember those who are refugees, who have nowhere to go, moving from place to place because they don't have a place to call their homes. Father, in this country, we got so much to be grateful for and so much to be thankful for, dear God. And miss the little problems we go through. So, God, we want to ask you to help us to be grateful. I pray this morning, dear God, for those kneeling at your footstool this morning, those who came up to the altar to pray before your God. Father, you know why they came up here. I don't know. You know their troubles. You know their joys. You know their sorrows. And, Father, you know why they left the benches to come before the altar to pray to you today. And, Father, whatever the reason is, I pray this time that you would hear their prayer. Father, those who didn't come, 
for those who are kneeling at the benches this morning. I pray a special prayer for them also, dear Jesus. Because we all children of your grace. This morning, Father, there is a word you have for us through your manservant, Pastor Kurt. We've heard him before, dear God, and you've, 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 you've used him to burn holes in our hearts. So this morning, Father, I ask in a special way that he wouldn't hold back, but he would preach it thus, said the Lord, dear God. So our hearts would be drawn closer to you. Forgive us, God. Father, if we have sinned against you, forgive us. If we have sinned against our fellow men, dear God, forgive us. And this week, dear Lord, as a new week just now would start, may we be a blessing to somebody this coming week, Father. Help us, God, not just to accept blessings, but to be blessings to others. So that men and women may see our good works and glorify our Father who is in heaven. We praise you this morning, God. For you alone are worthy of our praise. You alone are worthy of our worship. In Christ holy and in Christ precious name we pray. Praise Amen. God. Amen. Amen. When I look back and what I thought was living, I'm amazed at the price I chose to pay. And to think I ignore what really matters, cause I thought the sacrifice would be too great. But when I finally reached the point I've given in I found the cross was calling even then and even though it took dying to survive I never felt so much alive for I am crucified with Christ and yet I, but Christ will live within me. His cross will never ask for more than I can give. For it's not my strength, but His. There's no greater sacrifice. For I am crucified with Christ. And yet I live as I hear the Savior call for daily dying. I will vow we need the weight of Calvary. 
Let my hand surrender to his piercing purpose that holds me to the cross yet set me free. I will glory in the power of the cross and the things I count as gain I count as loss but with his suffering I, I identify and by his resurrection power I'm alive for I am crucified with Christ and yet I live not I but Christ will live within me his cross will never ask for more than I can give for is not my strength but his is no greater sacrifice for I am crucified with Christ and yet I For all I have, so that his cross will not in vain. For I found to live is Christ, and to die is truly gain. For I am crucified with Christ, and yet I live. Not I, but Christ will. will never ask for more than I can be for is not my strength but his there's a greater sacrifice for I am crucified with Christ and yet I George, you needed to hold that note a little longer. <laughs> but praise the Lord, that was a, a blessing to hear. Amen. I, uh, I need uh, some affirmation here at this moment, so let me just turn on this mic instead. One second here, we can turn this one off. All right, can you hear me? All right, excellent. Is anyone willing here to admit that they are a forgetful person? Oh, praise the Lord. The Lord has called me to this church to be among fellow believers here. <laughs> I am a forgetful person, almost hopelessly so. I say almost hopelessly because sometimes people say to me, Oh, Pastor, you're, you're getting the name so quickly. And I tell them, it is a, the gift of the Holy Spirit that I prayed for after the first church I was at. And I was so bad at names that at the end of the four years, there were people I didn't, like lots of people I didn't remember their names. I said, Lord, I can't be a pastor if I keep forgetting people's names like this. So he's answered that prayer, but there are still areas of my life untouched. And I am very forgetful. And to this point, why I'm saying this is uh, when we had the profession of faith today, we have two... Uh, 
members here uh, that they were baptized previously and we are going to accept them also into membership, accept their baptism um, as well. So I'm going to invite uh, Maya and David to, to come forward. Uh, amen. Come on forward, you guys. So uh, Maya, I believe, was baptized, you said, was it June 15th? June 17th of uh, last year, of, of 2023. And David, it is only recently that you were baptized, right? Yes. What day was it again? I, it was, uh, was la, not the week before last Saturday. The week before, two weeks, two Sabbaths ago. Two Sabbaths. Now, you correct me if, if, if I don't have this story straight, uh, but... It's a weird story. <laughs> I, I, I heard it from, from Brother George. I heard it secondhand. We hadn't had a chance to talk yet, but I heard... One Sabbath, that Sabbath, you were on your way church, to uh, church here. Yes, I was. Uh, happy Sabbath, everyone. <laughs> well, I was on my way here to, to church. Um, my ride, I took it in for oil change, only to hear that the mechanic tell me that my brakes have gone. The, sat the Saturday I was coming to church, but I was very late. I went at the bus stop, and while they were at the bus stop, like, I was standing there for almost half an hour, and there was no bus. So I started looking around, looking around, and I looked over across a graveyard, and I saw this little church. And I said, that looked like an Adventist church. I got out of the bus stop. I said, I'm going to walk down there. I walked down there and opened the door, went inside, only to see that, yes, it was an Adventist church. I lived across the street for four years. I never knew that there was an Adventist church. I already told pastor that I want him to baptize me. But while sitting there in the seat, the pastor was preaching and something was on me, like such burden was on me that I couldn't stop crying. My hands were trembling. My I was sweating from all over, and I think he recognized it, and um, he came over, he stopped the sermon and came over and he said, do you want to be baptized? And I said, yes. He said, when? And I said, now. Amen. Yes. And I, I am happy, I am happy that, yes, the decision wasn't made by me to get baptized in that church, but it was as you say, prophecy fulfilled. And I'm happy that I'm not, no longer a visitor, but I am a member and I hope that the people who saw me that day, who never knew me, my baptism was an example and I hope that many people would have, you know, follow. Like you come to church two times, three times as a visitor, the fourth or fifth time you, you're not a visitor anymore. Amen. Amen. I put up my hand the first time. The second time, I, I was saying to myself, who am I? I'm not a visitor. I, I know this church now. And people here saw me come in and out. I'm no longer a visitor. Who am I? Uh, I'm just floating around. And I don't think God needs any floaters. Amen. And I chose to follow him and put him first. Amen. And... Amen. That's my story. <laughs> amen, amen, amen. So I, I said, uh, it was actually Brother George who told me that story, and uh, I wanted it to be known because, I don't know, there's, there's some weird people out there that would be upset because they didn't get to baptize, but I'm, I'm not upset. I praise the Lord that, I mean, when David came to me, he shared his story of how he grew up in the church. We went through the vows together, and we were going to baptize him this Sabbath. But God had other plans, and we surrender to the plans of the Lord. And God had plans for Maya and baptizing her. Was it at King, King's, Kingsway, College. Kingsway College that Pastor Charlie baptized her? So uh, at this time... Uh, including those who, uh, I forgot to do this as well, speaking of forgetfulness, those who we accepted through profession of faith, those who have been baptized uh, recently and in the last year, and those through profession of faith, is there a motion to accept them into membership? It's moved, it's seconded, all in favor, just wave your hand, welcome. 
Amen. Let's give God praise for what he's done. God bless you, Sister Maya. God bless you. I'm really David. God bless you. Oh, I don't feel bad at all. Don't, you don't feel bad that I feel bad. God is at work. Amen. All right. Well, uh, let's pray, and uh, we will jump into the message uh, for today. Father in heaven, you are a good God, and I thank you for the way that you have worked in our church family. Even when we uh, have not seen it, we have heard testimony today of how you have worked, and we thank you for uh, Maya and David, how you have shown them your love, your grace and mercy, and for their commitments to you through baptism. And Father, as we are now about to enter into the, the message, I pray that um, you would use me because I am an imperfect vessel, but your spirit is perfect. And so speak through me in spite of me, and uh, may we be brought closer to your throne uh, through this time in our service together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so today we are continuing our sermon series, uh, A Lament for the Church. There are things, as I've said, as Adventists that we need to unlearn because we have not found them in Scripture, some practices and ways of living as Adventists that have gone against our calling as his people, and we need to relearn from the Word of God the call that he has for our life. The, the message today is titled, Noble Idolatry and Interpretation. Is there such a thing as noble idolatry? It should be, no, it's a paradox to even say that. But did you know that you can make the Bible an idol? You can make the Bible an idol. How, you say? The purpose of this book is to reveal to us the Word of God. And the Word of God are more, is more than just words on a page. We are told in John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. Jesus is the Word of God. And when we open these pages and we ask, and it's important to ask the Holy Spirit, because again, this is the Word of God. It's beyond our own understanding if we do not ask God himself living in us to reveal himself to us. In these pages, we don't just find verses to prove an argument. We don't just find an object that we lay on a table that somehow vanquishes all evil by it just being there. In these pages, we begin and foster and grow and deepen a relationship with Jesus. In these pages, God speaks to us transforms our lives and shows us more of who he is so we can show others more of who he is. But th if this is just becomes a string of words, a fancy activity, a religious devotion for no purpose other than to be cruel to others, to, like I said, prove an argument right, though truth is found in these pages. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. But if it, this just becomes some rhetorical device, my friends, this becomes an idol and has been used as such for terrible purposes in our world's history. But we don't want it to become that. And I hope what we learn today, it will, if we've been on that path, it will deviate our path to the, 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 the straight and narrow path that Jesus would have us go on. Uh, it, would, it would guard as a barrier from us departing from that way, the way of Jesus. The early Christians, by the way, before they were known as Christians, you know what they were called? The way, because they were those who followed the way of Jesus. I talked about last time I preached uh, from this series that a remnant is something that represents the original but has gone through a crisis church. We as Seventh-day Adventists, more than anyone else, are called to follow the way of Jesus. Amen. 
So today I'm hoping we will depart from forms of idolatry that have crept into even our understanding of Scripture, how we teach and maybe preach it, and the ways in which we live as a people will not follow the other paths that are quote-unquote Christian but have no founding in Scripture. And I'll tell you more what I mean as we go. I want to do a thought exercise. I've done it with our young people at one of our Friday nights. If, if you join us for Friday nights or sometimes even Wednesday nights for a prayer meeting, you get a preview sometimes into uh, uh, the sermons that will come in, in months or weeks ahead. But I want to do a thought exercise with you. So for the young people, this will be a little bit of a review. Um, but on the, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says some interesting words in chapter 5. That's where we're going to go next. But it invokes a question for us. Actually, I should have put this one first. The question is, does God change? I've heard no. Amen. We're told in Malachi, I am the Lord. I do not change. That is why your descendants of Jacob are not already destroyed. I am the Lord. I do not change. It is affirmed repeatedly other places in Scripture as well. But I want you to read this verse in Matthew chapter 5, verses 38 and 39 with me. Jesus says, You have heard the law that says the punishment must match the injury, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say, do not resist an evil person. If someone slaps you on the right cheek, Offer the other cheek also. What Jesus is referring to when he says, you have heard that it was said, he isn't just talking about some random person saying something. It was himself before he was God incarnate, God become flesh, God taking on the form of humanity, who said to Moses and the children of Israel gathered at Sinai, laying out the law before them, now suppose two men are fighting in Exodus chapter 21, the first part of chapter 22, but really focusing on 24 and 25. Exodus chapter 21, the first part of verse 22 says, now suppose two men are fighting. And they injure one another, right? Uh, verse 24, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a hand for a hand, a foot for a foot, a burn for a burn, a wound for a wound. A bruise for a bruise. My question again is, does God change? Amen, no. But there's tension now, isn't there? Because Jesus said, you've heard that it was said, and seems to change from an eye for an eye. Well, it does, that does change to now turn the other cheek. But like this verse states, I am the Lord, I do not change. The end of it reflects how God does not change. Because God doesn't change, he says through the prophet here, that is why you descendants of Jacob are not already destroyed. When I asked you the question, does God change? Whether you know it or not, your bias and we all come to the scriptures with a bias or a presupposition. There's another way to say bias. Your biases, your presuppositions will inform how you answer this question. When you open these pages, when I talk about making the Bible an idol, when it is not intended to be that, but to be the way in which we find the word of God, we find Jesus, we enter into relationship with him, Sometimes the way we have been raised, the past traditions we have come from, or maybe even our parents or grandparents that things still filtered in that didn't have their foundation in Scripture, whether we know it consciously or unconsciously, that's why presupposition is a good word because it covers all of that. We have this background, our life experiences that impact how we read the words on this page. The God that we read about. For example, when we're told by Jesus that God is Father, and when we pray to him, Father, 
who art in heaven. For example, if you didn't have a very good father growing up, your disposition to God as father may be influenced to now interpret what father is. And these past experiences, that's just one example, mind you, will have to be undone to say, for that example to carry it through, if you had a bad father growing up, an abusive one, the God of Scripture is not like that father. The God of Scripture is a father who is patient and kind and long-suffering, slow to anger. But when we first read the Scriptures, our biases can some un sometimes undoubtedly come through. But let me go back to this example of Jesus' words here, where he says, you've heard that it was said. And then what he said to the children of Israel, an eye for an eye. When the children of Israel came out of Egypt, and I appreciate Pastor Sherry giving us a further explanation. I even learned some, some things I didn't know about that timeline last week. You can always be learning. This is what I mean. We need to relearn things, unlearn things, relearn again. I the timeline of the 400 years in slavery. When they came out of Egypt, though, they had still spent a number of generations in that land. And they had picked up some of the culture of Egypt some of the ways of Egypt, the way in which they even started relating to their God was influenced by how the Egyptians related to their gods. The way that they did justice became less about the oral tradition that was passed on from Abraham going back to Noah and then beyond and was being influenced by gods like, like Ra and, and, and uh, Horus and, and the Egyptian pantheon whether they knew it consciously or not. And so when God called them out of Egypt and gave to them a law and said to them, an eye for an eye, it was revolutionary. Because in those days, if someone took your eye, you would take their head. So for God to say to a people at that time, an eye for an eye. It was closer to a fuller revelation, though it was not the full revelation yet of his love. It was closer to a fuller revelation of his love. I'll talk about this more in another sermon down the road. But the point that does not change about who God is is what 1 John chapter 4, verse 8 tells us, what the foundation of who we are as Seventh-day Adventists is and should be and needs to be if we are going to carry forward the work and finish it before Jesus comes back. It is the statement that God is love. When we talk about, and I ask the question, does God change? No, he does not. But what does not change about him? He is love. Not just loving. We can claim and we have seen examples of people who are loving. But God is the embodiment of love itself. And because you and I are sinners, and that love can be, if we were to fully see the love of God on full display, even now, it would be too much for many of us, if not all of us. I'll talk about that more in a second. So it was too much for the children of Israel when they came out of Egypt. If, if God had said to this people who were in slavery for 400 years, family, um, trauma, oppression, uh, subject to Pharaoh eventually, if he were to tell them, someone hits you or takes your eye, turn the other cheek, they would have said, we're not following this God anymore. They weren't ready for that type of love yet. And throughout history, when God is dealing with us as a people, as we're about to see, we are not always ready for the full expressions of his love and what that will have in terms of the call on our lives and the implications for how we are to live in this world. That's why I'm saying we need to unlearn some things we have learned. But when, when Israel had gone through over a thousand years, prophetic messages coming their way, Bab ex Bab Bab exile in Babylon, and then back, they have learned enough of his love and his mercy and his grace and his covenantal promises that when Jesus shows up on the scene, 
Not all are ready to hear it, but enough are ready to hear. If someone takes your eye or slaps you on the cheek, you turn to them, you give to them the other. The love of God is fully seen in the person of Jesus Christ. Show us the Father, one of his disciples asked. And he was told, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. If you want to know what God's love is like, it is fully expressed in Jesus. Amen. But if we, if we read the Bible in a way where we're just going to pad our biases, um, not be willing to see the ways in which God is more fully revealing to us his love, we will have a shallow form of holiness that will not make a difference, that will be self-righteous, that will just give people who are on the fence about God more reason to not believe in God. Let me show you what a shallow form of holiness is like when God actually talked about the Moabites. It was our scripture reading today. Go with me to Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 48. Jeremiah chapter 48, starting in verse 13. Jeremiah chapter 48, verse 13. It may be hard to read on the screen here, given the lighting. We're doing our best here, but turn with me in your, script, in your scriptures on your phone or on your Bibles printed so you can catch this. Jeremiah 48, starting in verse 13, says, At last, Moab will be ashamed of his idol, Shamash, at the people of Israel, as the people of Israel were ashamed of their gold calf at Bethel. You used to boast, we are heroes, mighty men of war, but now Moab and his towns will be destroyed. His promising youth are doomed to slaughter, says the king, whose name is the Lord of heaven's armies. When you read this today as a scripture reading, and you might even read it now, this might just seem like a very random verse to just bring up in the middle of this and talking about how God doesn't change, but it's the fact that his love doesn't change, and he's, he's revealing more of his love to us over time. And if it appears, one thing I didn't say, if it appears that God does change, it's not that he changes, but he is, in other words, meeting us as a people where we're at so that he can reveal more of his love. Because I don't know about you, but if you're looking out into the world today, if you're turning on news headlines, especially in North America, if you're looking at the political landscape of our time and how Christianity is now being brought up within that landscape, it should be very concerning to you, especially as Seventh-day Adventists. There's a term that's out there now being coined Christian nationalism. I mean, it's not a new term, but it's a term that is strangely being embraced by Christians now as if it is a badge of honor to be a Christian nationalist, to have your, your faith mixed with your partisan politics. By the way, I will never from this pulpit tell you who you, or imply even, who you should vote for. That's between you and God. But there is a movement out there that is trying to bring what we do as Christians into that partisan political realm. There is a way of doing life that was not unlike the people of Jeremiah's day, not just the Moabites, but his very own people, where we have gotten, and they got so far away from understanding God through his law for them at that time as it was, was taught in the temple and amongst the, the priestly communities. They had got so far away from that, and I believe we have gotten so far away from a proper understanding of how to read the Bible that these things in our culture are creeping into our lives, and, and, and the most dangerous ones to me are not just even the, the um, explicitly secular things creeping into our lives, but the things guised in religion and quote-unquote Christianity that people are getting us to come along with. And really, we're not furthering God's agenda, but we're going to talk about this in a second. We're furthering the agenda of the beast. 
as it's mentioned in Revelation. We're, we're, if you're, you're visiting here and you don't know what I'm talking about when I say the beast, it, it's a symbol in Revelation given to a quote-unquote Christian religious power that appears to be Christian, but really is, is carrying on the work of another power, of an enemy, and misrepresenting God. When we look at the Dark Ages and we see the Crusades that were fought, people, they, 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 there came a new religion, Islam, and, and, and Christians saw it as a threat. And how would they combat it? Not like their forefathers who in the pagan Roman Empire, when their newfound faith, the way of Jesus, went against the, the pagan cults of their day and were willing to lay down their lives without violence. And that actually led to more people becoming Christians because they looked at the early Christians and said, if they're being willing to be thrown to lions in the Colosseum, being put in boiling pots of oil, and they still won't give up their faith, I want to know who that God is and what he's about. But there came a time where, where that wasn't Christianity anymore. People had forgotten how to read their Bibles and study it for themselves. It was even taken away from them that they were taught just what the, the priest or the, their pastor would say, and, and they would say, this must be the truth. We're, we're being called to go fight a war in the name of Jesus and put to death these people who are not like us. That is the most shallow form of holiness that you can have. And that's actually what's happening here. Because when it says you used to boast, we are heroes, mighty men of war, but now Moab and his towns will be destroyed. His no most promising youth are doomed to slaughter that word for slaughter, you may not recognize the significance of it, especially in the English. But the only other time that this word that is translated here for slaughter, as I mentioned this professor last week, but as Oliver Glantz has recently uh, pointed out in, in one of his papers, War as Worship, Hollow Form of Holiness, this word for slaughter is actually the word used in Leviticus to talk about the killing of the sin offering the lamb and other offerings that are killed for the sake of religious service. Why is this important? Because Jeremiah is the first to use this cultic language, this religious language for putting to death an offering and equating it to the culture of his day. He uses it to even describe God's own people earlier on in Jeremiah. When Zedekiah's sons are killed, he uses this same word and says they're slaughtered, but using the word for offerings that are sacrificed. When children are slaughtered in the valley of uh, uh, Ben-Hinnom, it's child sacrifice, and he says they're slaughtered. What he's essentially calling out here in, in a verse that you would just pass by maybe quickly in your daily readings, he's saying the culture of the religious people of their day, and he even applies it to God's people. Like I said, when Zedekiah's sons are killed by Nebuchadnezzar by a result of a war that God didn't want them to get involved with, he's saying this is some sort of form of self-righteousness some form of religious nationalism that you've been caught up in. And you're, you're, you're taking your young, innocent boys and saying they can be put off to war and it's pleasing to, in the case of Moab, the gods. But even in my case, you're saying that the God uh, of Israel, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob delights in war like this. In the past, we have not so much Adventists, but I've seen it more in Adventist services in the United States. This is why I call it lament for the church. I I'm glad we don't have it here, to be honest. Not, but some churches in Canada do have this. I see pla flags planted at, at, at the platform, and we have, I have nothing against this country, Canada. It's given me a good life, amen. But to see in a religious pulpit the Canadian flag uplifted, in the, the American ones, the American flag uplifted, and then you have, you have veterans, and, and, and I know it is a, it is a, it is a, a great act of, 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 of perhaps selflessness to be willing to give your life for a cause that is greater than yourself. Don't get me wrong. But to say the wars uh, and the mechanisms of this world that take other people's life is something that we uplift in a religious service, in an Adventist service, that is not the way of Jesus. I, I'll be honest, and, and I see Brother Turner here. I, I haven't had it done here. But I'll be honest, I feel uncomfortable when we sing the national anthem in a church service. And I, why I bring up Brother Turner is because I know we do that as pathfinders. 
we, we are not part of Canada first and foremost as a people. We are part of the kingdom of God. And we will be good and loyal and faithful citizens as the Bible calls us to in places like Romans. We will recognize that God has placed the authorities over us that he has placed us under. But my citizenship is not first and foremost determined by my passport. And neither should yours. It's determined by the blood of the Lamb and the blood put on that banner. And so the practices that we engage in is not some syncretism or some mix of our religion mixed with the practices of our country and some political party even. It's not about there's a call to war and we must do our duty. We say, no, the way of Jesus is not taking up arms. It's laying down our arms. It's turning the swords into plowshares beating our guns into farming tools. This is the way of Jesus. But it has become something in our culture, especially to our neighbors of the South, but it's bleeding into our culture where this way of war and, and, and fighting for our, our Western uh, culture and America and Canada and, and this patriotism is, is hand in hand with our Christianity. This is something that God is not pleased in and says these type of scepters will be broken down. And it is the shallowest form of holiness that we can render. An example of this and why it is in our culture goes back to even, uh, again, with our neighbors to the south, the Civil War. And here is a depiction of a revival service that happened on the battlefield for the southern states that were fighting against the abolition of slavery. Could you imagine you are fighting to keep human beings as your property and then you're claiming to have a religious revival service where you're recommitting your life to Jesus? It makes no sense to me, but this has happened. And why was it allowed to happen? Because Christians opened their Bibles and used it as an idol. They didn't use it as the way to meet Jesus and have their lives changed. But they used it as a way to fuel their prejudices and their biases and their unchristlike behavior and had religious services before they were about to go to war and for the cause of making other human beings, black Americans, black African Americans, their property. God have mercy. Speaking to this, though, speaking of both the North and the South, who were making points from Scripture, uh, Dr. Darius Yankovitz, he, he's, I'll talk about him more next uh, week, but he says this, speaking of the ways we interpret Scripture and how people interpreted Scripture in those days. He said both sides, the North and the South, especially in the 1800s, um, atheism and secularism, though it was bubbling up, it really hadn't taken hold, especially in America. It said both considered the Bible to be God's revelation and thus only the only authoritative doctrine or sorry, only authoritative document for Christian doctrine and practice, to which we would say amen. The Bible is the only authoritative doc document for Christian doctrine and practice. But follow me here and follow him. Both claimed adherence to its teachings and advocated reading in it a in a plain manner. Fine, amen. And yet both arrived at dramatically different conclusions. How could this be? The most probable answer to this question lies in the two related but divergent approaches to hermeneutics. Hermeneutics is a fancy word to talk about how you understand something, how you interpret something. So biblical hermeneutics, how you interpret the Bible. Adopted by these two groups. At the risk of oversimplification, but for the sake of clarity, I would like to label these two approaches as static and dynamic. A static, as you see here, literalistic reading versus a dynamic literal reading. Static and dynamic hermeneutics. A static hermeneutic stops at the level of the text, thus embracing a literalistic approach to controversial biblical passages. Let me give you an example. A woman must not speak in church. You heard that say before, but we, we allow our, our sisters to come up here and speak a good word, amen? But that's an example of a static 
literalistic interpretation of the text. Such a reading of the text is then considered to transcend all cultural barriers and its conclusions to be applicable. It, it does something with the word of God that the word of God himself did not do with his own words. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. The cultural limitations of God's people at that time did not allow God to give the full revelation of his love. Turn the other cheek. We are not a people of violence. But there came a time where the culture was right and ripe for it. At the fullness of time, where not only he would give his life for us, the ultimate expression of his love, but give us practical teachings on how we care for a neighbor. If someone demands your shirt, your shirt you give it to them. If someone takes uh, your cheek with a blow, you turn the other. Radical ways of living out the gospel. But it, this plain, static reading does not, sorry, it transcends rather cultural barriers and its conclusions to be applicable. At all times and to all men, before, page 92, sorry, before continuing, it is necessary to distinguish between the terms literal and literalistic. Because I say we should read our Bible literally except in the cases like Revelation where we are told these are symbols that we need to find the literal application for. But Yuri Moskala, final uh, paragraph of this quote, another professor at Andrews University, the dean even uh, of the theological seminary, he says, offers this helpful explanation. Literal means that one reads the biblical text in its context with its intended message. Meanwhile, literalistic reading means that the biblical text is taken in a very narrow and dogmatic way without applying its contextual and larger theological considerations. That is a very fancy way to say, in the scriptures, the first and foremost way in which we understand God is God is love. If the way you are reading the text does not emphasize and promote that great truth above all other truths, God, before he is known for his power, and he is all-powerful, is known for his love. We understand his power first and foremost through his love, but there are Christians out there who understand his love first and foremost through his power. And that is not what the Bible teaches. When we read the pages of Scripture, we do not isolate a verse and just use it to prove our points and, and, and biases. And I'll be honest with you, church, I'm not going to call out any names today but I really want you to study not just what I'm saying, but what you hear from anyone for yourself because there are programs even on the Hope Channel and 3ABN where pastors get up there and they just proof text to you. They pull a verse here and there and they don't connect it to a larger context, but here's a point that I just want to make and I'll take a verse out of its context to show you that this is what the Bible is saying. We will be led astray if we study the Bible like that. We need to understand that verses are written in a larger context of a chapter and chapters in the larger context of, uh, of a book and books in the larger context of the whole of Scripture. When we ask what is God saying, we need to understand the people he's speaking it to so we can understand how he's speaking to us in our day. But if you just go and you let just someone fill up a bunch of slides, I mean, I'm doing, it, doing this now with slides, but if I'm just saying just take these at face value and don't study and don't look for the greater context, don't look for the meaning of the words, we'll become the worst type of Christian, the worst type of God's people that have existed in earth's history that aren't God's people but perpetuate things in the name of God that have nothing to do with him. In Revelation 13, verse 11 and 12, it says, then I saw another beast come up out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb, but he spoke with the voice of a dragon. He exercised all the authority of the first beast, and he required all the earth and its people to worship the first beast whose fatal wound had been healed. Revelation 13, verse 11 and 12. We are told here that there will come and there has come a power that will look like a lamb a political power that will look at its very foundation like it represents Christian principles. There will be a false prophet even in the later of this part of this chapter that carries on this work. So there'll be a people who go out 
acting as if they are Christians, but the way they live their lives, the implication of their words is actually that of the dragon. And this people come about and they're allowed to foster, not unlike the armies of the South in American Civil War history, because they take the Bible and they use it as a weapon rather than discovering a God who wants a relationship with you and me. Here is an example of static readings of Scripture that are loveless. Philemon, verses 15 to 16. A slave, uh, Anisimus, comes to Paul. He runs away from his master, Philemon. And Paul writes to Philemon and he says, It seems you lost Anisimus for a little while so that you could have him back forever. He is no longer like a slave to you. He is more than a slave, for he's a, he is a beloved brother, especially to me. Now he will mean much more to you, both as a man and as a brother in the Lord. Now there are some good things in there, but people in the South use verses like that to say, see, Paul told a slave to return to his master. The Bible condones slavery. Further, let me take this text, again, out of context. But a verse, it's there in the Bible, Ephesians 6, 5. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and trembling. Exodus 21, verse 21, from the passage we were reading earlier. God's giving the law, but he says, but if the slave recovers within a day or two, and he's speaking of when a master has struck the slave, if he recovers from that beating, then the owner shall not be punished since the slave is his property. You see how I could easily make an argument that the Bible condones slavery? If my understanding of God is not first and foremost, God is love. And if I don't understand that God's full revelation is seen in the person of Jesus. And if I don't understand that there was a people at a point in history that weren't ready because they would not fo have followed this God to be told, free the slaves. But in the Old Testament... And in the New Testament, even these verses that we read in Philemon, there are these seeds of the gospel that would lead to a time like in the 1800s and beyond that would teach Christians owning another human being as property is unbiblical. Mm. Ellen White says this, speaking of texts like Philemon, she says it was not the apostle's purpose or sorry, apostles' work, to overturn arbitrarily or suddenly the established order of society. To attempt this would be to prevent the success of the gospel. But he taught principles which struck at the very foundation of slavery and which, if carried into effect, would surely undermine the whole system. Powerful. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom, he declared in 2 Corinthians 3.17. When converted, the slave became a member of the body of Christ, and such was to be loved and treated as a brother, no longer a piece of property. You see value in a person now. A fellow heir with his master to the blessings of God. Could you imagine that? A slave owner and his slave? Paul is saying, you're both going to sit on the same throne. It starts to undo these pathways in the brain that biases have formed that have allowed a slave master to be cruel and harsh and to even own another human being. It doesn't make sense that I own the same person that will sit on the same throne as me, who is made in the image of God like me. <sighs> on the other hand, servants were to perform their duties, but not with eye service as men pleasers, but as servants of Christ, doing the will of God from their heart. In other words, Paul was saying... There's going to come a time where heaven, we won't have slave owners, of course, but everyone's going to be serving one another. Amen. And you're actually ahead of your master in your growth as a Christian in that right now. You can use this terrible, traumatic, and toxic experience to actually have a, have, have a piece of what the kingdom of God is like. But to the masters, Paul and God, when he would teach things like the year of Jubilee, where the slaves were freed, there were these seeds of the gospel that would undo the whole system. Why I'm telling you this, church, is because there are things in our life 
as Adventists. There are things in our world today, and it's not for me to point them out right now, but there are ways in which we have failed in showing the love of God to others who are oppressed and broken down and have been left with a bad taste of God in their mouths. Jesus said to his disciples after he was resurrected, could you imagine this? Or sorry, before, sorry, before he was about to be crucified. So they've had the three and a half years with Jesus and they don't understand everything yet themselves. Even before he's about to be taken up to heaven, they say, is this now when you will establish your kingdom? Almost like an empire like the Romans. He's like, oh, you don't understand what my kingdom is like yet. And he ascends and he says to them beforehand so that they would understand they don't fully get it yet and we don't fully get God's love fully yet. There is John, John 16, verse 12. John 16, verse 12 says, there is so much more I want to tell you, but you can't bear it now. Church, I lament when I see churches, Adventist churches, invite political leaders of a political party and have them come up on their pulpit on Sabbath with on the screen like this screen, have their campaign slogans there and speak how they're wanting to restore Christian ways of life. I don't care if you vote for them or not. I don't, it's not my point here. I don't find, a, I'll just say in my life, I don't have a political home. I don't feel at comfort with any of partisan politics. But I say this because the implications of God's love is political. To free slaves is political. To love people made in the image of God who are different than you, believe different than you, act different than you, and say they are worth the blood of Jesus, and that their name is actually in the book of life, and it will be up to them and the example we give them of Jesus of whether or not they will be blotted out. The implication is they're in the book of life if you miss that. There's no one in this earth's history. I don't care how they were born. I don't care about their religious convictions right now. I don't care about their lifestyle. <sighs> they are in the book of life. And yes, God wants to transform their life through the Holy Spirit. Amen. But we have gotten in the way of that transformation because of our prejudices and our biases and using even verses of Scripture to beat people down and oppress people, and make people feel less than us. We have done this because often case, like the children of Israel who God actually had to tell them, someone hits you, take a blow also. A strange thing for God to say. But he did it so that he could show them, I want you to have nothing to do with that violent way of life. He says to us now, church, you have prejudices in your midst. You have things that cause division in your midst. You have things that you have given into systems of oppression in that beast power that looks like a lamb but speaks like a dragon. You have invited political leaders to come up and share your pulpit. God have mercy. And I, I want to say this because I did bring up that example. That happened in our conference in the last year, but thank God our administration sent out a communication. If you didn't hear it, you should have. But a communication to say we don't do that as Adventists. We were a people who were apolitical in terms of partisan politics because we knew our citizenship was that of heaven. Amen. And so when you and I live our lives, church, whatever your understanding of Scripture is, you have to bring it back to the words and the ultimate truth that gives light to all other truths. God is love. And just like there was a time, even when the New Testament was written, that there were ways of doing life. Slavery was the example I gave. That obviously we would, I hope, in unan unanimous conviction declare, slavery is wrong. Do you not think that there are other things in our world today that we might be giving lip service to that has nothing to do with God is love? In other words, we might not be 
extending the arm of fellowship to people, allowing them to come into this place as they are so the Spirit can transform their lives, but not allowing them to come because our prejudices are getting in the way, it's happening. I'm going to wrap up now. I have more to say to you that you cannot bear now. It is not the brightness of God that would have merely consumed M Moses if he, if he was not hidden in the cleft of the rock. Though the brightness, I'm sure, wouldn't have been good for him. But in the end, he came down that mountain shining. It's the love of God put into practice that throughout history is too much for us sinful human beings. When Jesus decided that when they came to capture him, his betrayer betraying him with a kiss, Peter said, I'm going to take up this sword. Peter was willing to follow Jesus to the grave. But if that grave meant revolution in the process. But that was not the way of Jesus. He went silently like a lamb prepared for the slaughter. By the way, you know what the difference between a goat and a lamb is that is going to be killed? If anyone here has raised goats and lambs and you've had to kill either, a goat, before it's killed, it goes crazy. And it's messy. It's gross. A lamb, though, the way of Jesus, nonviolent, pacifist in animal form, ready to take what was not deserved. Jesus took our sin, our ways of violence, our prejudices, racisms, bigotry, and he buried them with him in the grave. Everything we do and have done that is not reflective of God is love, he's put it in the grave. And there have been interpretations of scripture along the way that a people full of the spirit have realized, wait a second, Jesus is telling me more, and you can back it up in Scripture. Now, don't just take anyone because they're saying the Spirit of God is telling them this at face value. Test the Spirit, Paul says. But we will find enough in the Word of God to show us maybe old ways of doing things, like has been done in the past, are in error. And even if we cannot bear it now, pray that the Holy Spirit will allow you to see more and more of God is love each day. Amen. And as the world gets closer to his return and Christians continue to do terrible things in the name of Jesus, not following the way of Jesus, I believe there will be a people who will have heard the more things that Jesus has to tell them and they will walk in it. I've stayed away from specific examples because I don't know if I'm able to bear it even, if you're able to bear it. But I know, because I've done this job long enough, that I'm sure the Spirit brought up things in your heart, prejudices that you may have, things that you're thinking, maybe I need to go back and read my, my Bible about these things. And so go back and study those things. Again, I'm not going to be specific, but I'm calling you, if you want to be a people that say, Pastor or Anthony, I want to unlearn things that may be misrepresenting God in my life as a Christian. I want God to take away the prejudices I have in my life. And above all else, church, if you, as I've preached it today, and I, I, I risk that I might not have anyone stand for this, but if you want to say, Lord, I want to understand your word through the first and foremost teaching of your word. God is love. And understand who you are through the person of Jesus. Will you stand with me today? Don't just stand because everyone else is standing. Okay. Amen. This is no light commitment today, church. Because there will be times where Christians... Even people who have stood today, just because I know how it goes, there will be people who continue to exploit the idol, the idolatry of the Bible, rather than being in relationship with the Word of God. But it will be up to you today, through the Spirit of God working in your lives, to show people that there is a Jesus out there who died for sinners, 
There is a Jesus out there who, who didn't turn away any person from coming to his table or their life from being hidden in his body on the cross. It will be up to you, church, to show a God who does not exclude and push away, but says, come to me, you who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So if you stood today, church, when you leave this place, in your workplaces, in your schools, you're not going to go alongside what's easy often for the Christian to do that often perpetuates stories of hatred and violence and beastly power. But you're going to be the people that God has called you to be, a remnant people. God is love. May it be on your lips. May it be on your heart through the Spirit of God, Father in heaven. May your spirit reign supreme in the lives of your church today. I know I've gone a little bit long, but I pray that the length of my speech will not lessen the impact of the lessons that you have to teach me and my church family from your word. The things that aren't based in your love that need to be unlearned. The ways of reading the Bible that need to be done away with where we have a more dynamic and comprehensive way of reading your word in line with God is love. Teach us, Lord. Give us new eyes and new hearts to read your word, study your word, and come to Jesus so that we may bring others in the way that you brought others to your table when you walk this earth and bring others to your cross as, as they were brought into your body there. Father, forgive us where we have fallen short of these things. Forgive us for our prejudices. Forgive us for our biases. Forgive us for our bigotry even. And help us to follow the way of Jesus, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Be seated. Five hundred and thirty-eight. Guide me, O thou great Jehovah. Guide me, O thou great Jehovah, pilgrim through this barren land. I am. But thou art mighty, hold me with thy powerful hand. Bread of heaven, bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Feed me till I want no more. Open. Jehovah guide you on this pilgrim's way. May he use you to break the bonds of the oppressor, to give sight even to the blind, to break the shackles of the prisoner, and to up 
lift the outcast and bring them into the family of God. May the Spirit of God work in your lives so closely that the grace of God would not only be given to you, but be extended to all that Jesus died for. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Anywhere with Jesus. And in the meantime.